Thank you, everybody. We're going to have our final uh, formal session of this afternoon. This is a session on international. Just as a reminder, there will be an open mic that follows immediately after this panel. There is a sign-up sheet on the back table in the wall, so if you could please sign up in, in case you'd like to participate. As mentioned earlier, both panelists and members of the audience are, are free to participate, so just please sign up. Um, my name is Maria Strong, Deputy Director for Policy and International Affairs. We continue to be joined by Kim Isbell of PIA, um, Kevin Amer, Deputy General Counsel, and we're joined this afternoon with Emily Lanza, Counsel in Policy and International Affairs as well. So welcome to the session on international issues, and as we indicated in the roundtable notice, participants in this session are, quote, invited to identify and discuss recent law and policy developments in other countries that bear on issues related to the effectiveness, ineffectiveness, and or impacts on online service provider liability since early 2017. So this session on international uh, issues is intended to supplement the record for our report to Congress. As you know, many of our reports, including those on the making available right, small copyright claims, resale royalties, orphan works, just to name a few, do contain discussions of copyright-related uh, activities and developments. So the companies and creators on this particular panel, this table, are involved in the global creation and distribution of copyrighted content, and some may have business as well as enforcement uh, operations in other countries. So the offices believes that your views and experiences in participating in other regimes outside the United States will be very informative and insightful for this study. So as you can tell, we have the largest panel of the day, the most time, and we have plenty to talk about. So let's get started with a 45-second introduction toward a tabla. Um, for scheduling issues, I'm going to invite um, Carlo Lavazzari of International STM Association to start first, and then we'll go back in alphabetical order. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm a lawyer in private practice, Lens Camera, and I'm the legal counsel to the STM Association, which does not stand for standard technical <laughs> <laughs> measure. It is scientific, technical, and medical publishers, uh, some 138 members that publish uh, science, technology, medicine, but also arts, humanities, and social sciences publications. Together, they represent about 60, 65% of what is being published in those areas. So picking up on the panels we have had the pleasure of listening to earlier today, um, I, I think in, 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 uh, I will focus on, on European developments. Um, and there, I would say, the internet in the last 30 years has not been static, and the, the, the developments are dynamic in, in Europe, basically moving from a system of platform liability and safe harbor to one of responsibility. And that is not just uh, borne by legislation, but especially by case law. Case law in the European uh, countries such as Germany, France, Italy, Spain, uh, the UK for the time being, and also by the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union. The question today in Europe is not how to fix a broken notice and take down whack-a-mole system. The question is how do platforms deal with their responsibility? How do they discharge the duties that they have? And not in a one-size-fits-all way, but based on the risk that they introduce based on the service models that they have chosen for themselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams. Good afternoon. I'm Stan Adams with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, through both our DC and Brussels office, we advocate for an open internet, one in which all people can express themselves freely. Uh, while we view articles 11 and 13, or whatever their current numbers are, uh, of the EU copyright directive as fundamentally problematic to free expression, we continue to believe that section 512 preserves an appropriate balance uh, between the interests and abilities of stakeholders in the online ecosystem. It's worth noting that although the internet and the web are incredible tools for the marketing and distribution of content, uh, those are not their only functions. It is important to remember that the web is also, also the default option for sharing and expressing between people. Section 512 is a foundational element for this capability, giving rise to many of the platforms that allow creators of all kinds to share their work with more people than ever before. The EU has removed this foundational stability. Thank you, Mr. Katie. 
My name is Eric Cady, and I am Senior Counsel with the Independent Film and Television Alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to continue IFTA's participation in the Section 512 study and for today's discussion on service provider liability for infringing content online. This continues to be a global problem for IFTA members who are faced with massive online infringement with no way under current law to prevent or stop the introduction and rapid proliferation of illegal copies across the internet. IFTA represents more than 145 companies in 23 countries around the world, the majority of which are small to medium-sized US-based businesses that have produced, financed, and distributed many of the world's most prominent films, including 80% of the Academy Award winnings, winning films uh, since 1980. In terms of developments, we are encouraged by the European Parliament's recent approval of the Copyright Directive to the extent that it recognizes the serious need to rebalance the notice and takedown framework with respect to online content sharing service providers, which to date have had no incentive to discourage users from further uploading infringing content because that content drives revenue to the platforms. And we look forward to discussing these issues further. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Coffey. Can you hear me? Danielle Coffey with the News Media Alliance. We represent two, 2,000 publishers, news publishers, and we, I spend most of my days making sure that we have a better business arrangement through favorable regulatory treatment, which will lead to a business model to sustain quality journalism. Um, and I think we can all agree that that's critical to an informed democracy in a civic society. And thank you for having us here today um, so that we can represent the news media's views with regard to Article 11, the EU publisher's right, which is now known as Article 15 in the Copyright Directive, which we hope will be passed expeditiously. Thank you. Mr. French. Hi, Alec French here with Thorson French Advocacy. Um, I have a number of creative community clients, but I'm not speaking on any of their behalfs today. Um, rather, uh, I'd like to speak as someone who's been an advocate for creators um, since before Section 512 reared its ugly head as the legislative price to pay for the rest of the DMCA. Um, I want to focus on one aspect of Article 13, or now 17, adopted by the EP. Um, Specifically, the differing obligations, Article 13 applies to large and small UGC sites. I think it's a really reasonable principle that the U.S. should consider adopting more broadly. The Europeans clearly decided innovation by Internet startups would not be impacted by requiring companies with $500 billion market caps and more than $100 billion in cash on hand to secure licenses from rights holders and filter and keep down infringing material. Similarly, limiting the availability of current Section 512 to Internet startups will not impair their ability to innovate, but may prevent Section 512C in particular from continuing to operate as a legislative license for multi-billion dollar companies to ignore and profit from infringement with impunity. In short, the big versus small distinction drawn in Article 13 is one European export I think we should welcome in the U.S. Thank you. Ms. Friedman. Hi there, can you hear me? My name is Ashley Friedman. I'm the Senior Policy Director of the Information Technology Industry Council. ITI is um, a trade association representing about 70 companies in the hardware, software, internet, semiconductor, fintech, basically all aspects of the technology sector. We do business, our companies do business in every market um, in the world, um, and we cover from a policy perspective pretty much every policy issue um, that impacts the tech sector. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today to exchange our views and hear from the others on the panel um, because really for us, the DMCA overall in this section in particular um, is really fundamental to providing that balance between innovation and strong protections. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamel. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am the Executive Director of Recreate. Um, my coalition members are very concerned about recent developments in Europe. Specifically, we are concerned about the art impacts of Articles 15 and 17, formerly 11 and 13. Um, I hope today we'll get the opportunity to talk about the impact we'll have not just in Europe, where European consumers, innovators, and creators will be harmed, but also here in the U.S., where it will have an impact on inver American investment in the Internet, many smaller startups who can't meet the test under the, under the bill. 
as well as the operations of large US internet platforms and US creators who will have a lot more trouble reaching the American market. Since the last round table, two things have changed. Number one, profits are up in the creative industry. Number two, inf piracy is down. And I think those are two important things that have changed over the last two and a half years that we need to note. Addition additionally, we've seen exponential growth in the amount of cr creators choosing to forego traditional, inter traditional industry intermediaries and reach their audience directly through platforms like Amazon Publishing, YouTube, TikTok, Etsy, and many more. We recently did an extremely conservative estimate that only looked at nine of these platforms and only the top source of income on each of these platforms and found that approximately 17 million Americans are creating and distributing content online without traditional intermediaries. Some are doing so for fun. Others are, are still trying to make it, while other have others have turned into their own small businesses with their own employees while making a nice living. And Europe, Europe's new copyright directive threatens all their ability to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Stan McCoy, and I run the European arm of the Motion Picture Association. Uh, we support the EU approach to no-fault injunctive relief, reflected in Article 8.3 of the 2001 Directive. As to liability, we would suggest that you look to recent ECJ case law rather than the new EU Directive as the model. While the original proposal to clarify communication to the public and that directive was good, in the end we find we have to agree with European audiovisual sector rights holders who dislike the burn inconsistent notification rules in Article 17, dislike its emphasis on licensing where AV needs enforcement, and dislike its UGC language which contradicts the Commission's own impact assessment. The ECJ has done much better in cases like the Pirate Bay and Filmspeler. I'd be happy to talk at greater length about any of those subjects if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McSherry. Hi, um, my name's Corinne McSherry, and I'm the legal director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and EFF has been involved in most of the Section 512 litigation over the past two decades, either as amicus or lead counsel. And I was lead counsel on the Lens case, which I'm more than happy to talk about <laughs> at length. But um, that's not why I'm here today. Um, I'm here to focus my remarks on Article 17 in particular. Um, EFF worked very closely with our partners in Europe to oppose the inclusion of Article 17 in the new copyright directive. And we did that because we know that Article 17 would inhibit online, ex online expression, forcing service providers to embrace upload filters. EFF, at EFF, we understand that the work we're doing here today in thinking about copyright policy, when you're formulating copyright policy, you're formulating speech policy and innovation policy. That is what we are talking about here today, and we understand that. Um, if, as we expect, we're going to see the adoption of upload filters across Europe in order to avoid liability, um, those filters are inevitably going to flag a lawful as well as potentially infringing content. Why do we know this? Because we have a decade of experience with content ID. What we have seen in Content ID, in which YouTube has invested millions of dollars, um, despite that investment, Content ID regularly misidentifies all kinds of content, bird songs, white noise, public domain performances, clear fair uses, like clips and lectures. Um, so we know that those mistakes are going to happen. And for those who say, well, those mistakes are the exception, um, Stan Adams actually pointed out that um, at roughly 300,000 new YouTube videos a day, a system that incorrectly flags only one-tenth of a percent of them still removes or blocks 300 lawful posts. That's a lot of lawful speech, and that's what we're talking about. So that's just one of many reasons that millions of internet users, not to mention the technologists who built the internet, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Free Expression all spoke out on Article 13. I hope this office will as well in your report and expressly recommend against importing this very bad policy to the United States. Thank you, Ms. Oyama. Good afternoon, I'm Katie Oyama with Google. Um, we do agree that the DMCA has allowed for an explosion of creativity and economic growth. It's led to the development of robust anti-piracy tools. Uh, today, the internet enables more than $27.7 trillion a year in global e-commerce. And the growth of these legitimate online services made possible by the balanced US legal approach has also driven billions of dollars to the entertainment industries that might otherwise be lost to piracy. We're really happy to see that global 
um, box office revenue is up, global recorded music revenue is up. On the specific topic of the EU copyright directive, we believe that the directive will not help, but will rather set Europe backwards. Um, we believe that it will harm Europe's creative and digital economy. Unlike the recently passed US law, the Music Modernization Act, which was a win, win, win for rights holders, for users, for platforms, the EU copyright directive poses the potential for massive um, and dramatic consequences, uh, particularly in overblocking of content as platforms become fearful of additional liability. Um, and the details will matter and the implementation will matter. And so we look forward to working with, um, in particular, the member states as the directive is implemented um, across Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Hi, my name is Steve Rosenthal. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was wondering why you skipped. There you go. <laughs> Mr. Randall, my mistake. <laughs> no problem. Chris Randall with Facebook. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, Facebook has submitted previous comments, uh, and we want to reiterate our strong support today for the U.S. DMCA framework. We also wanted to update uh, the panel today on the innovative steps we're taking to protect intellectual property rights, all of which are enabled by the strong and balanced DMCA approach. The purpose of the DMCA was to encourage collaboration between rights holders and platforms to effectively combat pri piracy. And that is entirely in line with our approach. And we're excited about the new tools and partnerships we've been developing over the past years. For example, we've invested in building our video matching tool, Rights Manager, which provides control to rights holders regarding their content on Facebook. This is in addition to our decade-long employment of Audible Magic, an investment in building the, co the Commerce and Ads IP tool. These are important illustrations of how this kind of collaboration can lead to real and effective technical solutions, but only if it's voluntary, adaptable, and flexible. Over the past few years, we've also been, de been developing strong partnerships with rights holders in all sectors. We're proud that we empower content creators of all types with new avenues of sharing their content, driving offline viewership, and publicizing their new creativity. We partner with various rights holders, including those in the music, entertaining, entertainment, and publishing industries. Our partnerships have resulted in testing new monetization structures that support new publisher subscription-based models. The flexible legislative frameworks like the DMCA allow us to take into account changing needs and new market solutions in order to offer rights owners top IP tools for protecting and promoting their content. We look forward to sharing additional views today. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you. My name is Steve Rosenthal. I'm Senior Director of Anti-Piracy for McGraw-Hill Education. Uh, piggybacking on the 512H discussion of last session, uh, one of the tools that rights holders rely on to enforce their rights against pirate websites is the WHOIS system that is intended to identify who is responsible for a domain name or an IP address. Having this identifying information is integral to pursuing the operators of these infringing sites. However, the goal of resources like WHOIS has recently conflicted with the interests of the EU GDPR that seeks to restrict public access to details of private individuals, including those operating these sites. We have seen a number of instances where identifying data previously available on a WHOIS or similar search result was suddenly redacted and hidden from public view. At the same time, we have seen a proliferation of content delivery networks such as Cloudflare providing services that anonymize the identity of online service providers in the pretext of furthering security interests. This impacts the rights owner's ability to enforce against the bad actors, Unfortunately, the DMCA subpoena process often provides no alternative solution to this problem, as these subpoenas many times lead to useless, inaccurate identifying information, which is self-reported by the infringer. These impediments negatively impact rights owners' ability to effectively enforce their rights. Thank you, Mr. Shores. Thank you. My name is Matt Shears. I'm with the Computer and Communications Industry Association, a trade association of internet and tech firms, which ranges in size from small startups to household names. Um, at the same time that there's growing consensus over the protections and obligations of the DMCA, and that approach is being increasingly adopted by our trading partners overseas, 
Uh, there's a unique exception to that, uh, which is the increasing uncertainty emanating from Europe about its own approach, uh, which until now has been more in harmony with the U.S. approach than in conflict, uh, but that is starting to change. Now, with respect to the U.S. approach, um, as a recent research report actually released by CCIA today, the latest in our Sky is Rising series, demonstrates data from numerous third-party content industry organizations shows growth across the creative sector, indicating that the current notice and takedown system is working. Uh, by contrast, the extraordinary controversy over and criticism of Article 13-17 of the EU Directive uh, from all sectors, as we've already heard from other speakers, ranging from creative industry interests, academics, startups, civil society, and human rights organizations, all of that criticism suggests that the EU is out of step with the U.S. norm uh, and increasingly the international norm, uh, and that that's creating great uncertainty, which we should uh, regard with some skepticism if we're going to take any policy lessons from that. Other than that, uh, this is a source of uh, business investment deterrence and potential risk to uh, uh, free speech and consumer expression interests. Uh, thank you. I look forward to discussing the issue further. Thank you. Ms. Simpson. Uh, Louis Simpson, Association of American Publishers. AAP encourages the U.S. Copyright Office to take account of the disruptive effect website blocking has on blatantly pirate sites. There are now some 40 countries with a website blocking statute or are considering its adoption. In Europe alone, some 1,800 websites and over 5,300 domains have been blocked, and yet despite these blocks, the Internet has not and is not broken. Publishers have successfully pursued the remedy in six European countries against a notorious pirate site engaged in providing unauthorized access to STM journal articles. It is high time the U.S. looked to adopting additional meaningful tools to enable rights holders to tackle online piracy as a mere takedown is not enough to effectively address the nature and scope of online piracy that rights holders face today. Thank you. Mr. Sai. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Sherwin C. I'm here on behalf of the Wikimedia Foundation. We are the nonprofit that supports uh, various projects, including Wikipedia. Actually, Wikipedia is in nearly 300 different languages, as well as Wikimedia Commons. Um, we are very concerned with the provisions of the European Copyright Directive recently passed, particularly Article, formerly Article 13, now Article 17. And I think in contrast to uh, some suggestions that have been made, uh, don't believe that it is a good model uh, for proceeding in copyright policy. Um, this is in part because it is just passed and its results are, I think, um, unclear and how it will affect the uh, online ecosystem is unclear, um, both in its provisions and in its implementation in member states. Uh, beyond its novelty, uh, there is also the uncertainty within it. Uh, there's tension between uh, some of the recitations and its provisions and tensions within the provisions themselves that uh, raise a lot of the issues that we've been discussing uh, for the uh, pr uh, previous several hours as well in more settled uh, legislation in the United States. Um, beyond this, I think I'd also like to make the point that uh, Wikipedias and w Wikimedia Commons occupy an interesting space in this discussion in that they are very large websites, at least very prominent websites, with a very small staff, with a very large uh, user base and a very large contributor base, but that exist for very specific purposes uh, that aren't often discussed in these conversations. And the effects of these policies uh, on a fairly unique uh, system like ours and many others that don't fit the model of a general purpose, uh, a general purpose uh, sh sharing site uh, often get ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vollmer. Thank you for convening this panel. I'm Abby Vollmer, Senior Policy Manager at GitHub. GitHub is the world's leading platform for developers to build software. And from the perspective of software development, we're driving innovation across countless industries, and the safe harbor has been essential to enabling innovation to thrive over the past few decades. GitHub itself relies on the safe harbor because software code is subject to copyright, and the notice and takedown system has generally worked well for us. When we learned of the proposed Article 13, now Article 17, in the EU, we were very concerned because it puts the safe harbor that software development relies on at risk. 
we were able to secure a carve out for open source software developing and sharing platforms, but there are countless other services that software developers are building that are not within the scope of that exclusion. This underscores the fact that tinkering with the safe harbor in the way that the EU policymakers did puts the economy and innovation at risk. I made a few trips to Brussels and I spoke directly with EU policymakers there over the course of the negotiations of this directive. And I'd be happy to chat with you and look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolvers. Last but not least, um, <laughs> uh, I'm Rachel Wolvers, the policy director at Engine. We're a nonprofit that advocates on behalf of startups. Uh, the internet allows entrepreneurs to scale quickly by reaching a global audience, but in order for American startups to thrive, foreign markets must offer a similarly balanced copyright framework like the one we have in the United States. Recent developments in copyright law, notably the EU Copyright Directive, will stifle American startups and reduce competition abroad. Article 13 slash 17 uh, forces startups and other platforms use expensive and ineffective content moderation tools to police user-generated content, and the startup exception is not workable. The impact of this directive will likely be felt across the world as startups are forced to reimagine their global presence and restrict user-generated content. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a busy agenda today. I, I'm hearing a lot from the table about the concern over Europe, and that's understandable. Um, I do want to accomplish, at least through this session, issues on liability and you know various kinds of notice systems around the world. Second, um, how do we view effectiveness in other markets? Third, what is the status of cooperation between local ISPs and rights holders? That was a subject that came up in, in some of our earlier sessions today. And last but certainly not least, um, the scope of injunctive relief and the availability of website blocking. Um, and I'm sure several of you will speak to trends on that. But if we start at the first kind of bucket, which will be you know notice systems and liability, um, I think we just need to sort of start with Europe because that is right in front of us. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of a softball question, um, realizing that as, as, as uh, Mr. Seem noticed that this was just recently adopted. It has still not been finally adopted. There's two years of implementation, 27 or 28 different ways. Um, but what I'd like to hear from you is what might be your top one or two issues that you see in the directive because, as I think as Ms. Wolvers so accurately noted uh, is that it, will this directive require American companies um, and users, whether you're, share, you're, whether you're stakeholders or on the content side, how will it affect your doing business in Europe? And then thinking ahead, how might that affect your business doing here? So I'm looking for you know one or top two issues with, with the directive, whether it's the definitions, the big small issue, the, well, the liability issue. Um, I'm curious to know, since we have a lot of experts at the table, um, the flag is up, and Mr. Lavazari. Thank you. Well, I think that the top uh, two issues are to what extent will Article 17 uh, codify really the case law that has been created by the Court of Justice, specifically on active platforms, platforms that are um, structurally infringing and that are accordingly held themselves not to be able to hide behind the user, not to pretend that they're standing in the user's shoes, but are in fact carrying out the communication to the public. Uh, in this regard, two cases, YouTube and Elsevier, are cases pending in front of the Court of Justice, and we are very eager to see to what extent they will now take into account the Article 17 and hopefully see the previous case law confirmed. Um, the Second issue will be the, not the, the different standards for platforms, how they uh, carry out their responsibility. Um, will that change? The, the Court of Justice at the moment has different standards depending on the risk profile. If you choose to have unidentified anonymous users, you are held to a much higher standard. Um, to make sure the risk you create through your business model does not negatively affect copyright holders. We would hope that uh, this uh, case law that is quite robust is, is not um, impaired by the promises of licensing that Article 17 also creates. Thank you. Ms. Simpson. So 
We don't think Article 17 is actually going to be a problem because in the recitals, it does say that this is intended to be a clarification of existing EU law. So if you look to the German court cases, I know it's going back before 2017, but the rapid share case actually was a clear enunciation of the Sturhaftung principle in German law. And it made clear in that case that, as Carlo mentioned, if you have set up your platform so that it does intend to facilitate infringement, you have actually taken it upon yourself to undertake certain responsibilities as enunciated in Sturhaftung. And so that does not change with Article 17. So, Obviously, there are uncertainties with respect to how individual countries will implement that statute, but the fundamental position here is that EU law is sound with respect to how its case law has developed on the question of platform responsibility and not just mere liability and safeguards, as Carlo and, and I think also as Mr. McCoy has stated. Thank you. Ms. Fulmer. So I think the, the number one problem from our perspective is filtering. And even though, like I mentioned, there is a carve out for open source software platform, so in GitHub itself seems to be okay with respect to the EU, there's so much else that goes on that's important for software development, important for innovation that's not there. And whether or not the statute, the directive actually says the word filtering, the reality is the requirements are gonna incentivize a lot of platforms to filter so that they don't have to um, potentially subject themselves to liability. And so I just wanna say a few words about for us why Filtering is very problematic. Um, so GitHub is the home of open source software. Open source refers to open source licensing, and that's a form of copyright. So software developers who choose to license their code under an open source license, there are various licenses, but there are four main, main um, tenets, that freedoms that are, that are um, present in open source licenses. So the ability to study, the ability to use, the ability to modify, and the ability to redistribute. So rights holders that are software developers who've created software code and are sharing that on the internet want it to be shared. And they're not making money off of that and GitHub is not making money off of that either. So this is, you know, it took a lot of conversations with policymakers in Brussels, but this is kind of where we were coming from that, hey, if you're gonna legislate on this level, you need to really think about the kinds of content that's copyrighted on the internet and figure out whether the way that you're going about applying requirements is actually helping all rights holders or not. Because in our case, if that content disappears, not only is that cutting into the open source software holders' rights, but also the way that code is built collaboratively online means that you have hundreds of different dependencies, like blocks of code. They're all licensed potentially differently. And if a filter, if a false positive from a filter detects a block of code and that disappears, then you've got a broken software project. So I understand this is you know, not necessarily applicable to all kinds of content, but the point I want to make is that you know, we really do need to be thinking nuanced here about how we go about doing things. And as I mentioned, even though we were able to carve ourselves out, we we're very concerned about the bigger picture and all, everything else that didn't get carved Thank out. Thank you. Point taken. Mr. C. Thank you. Um, yes, as, as the uh, recipients of another carve out, um, I'm aware that um, our, our potential liability under this might be limited, though I will, you know, the online encyclopedias are only one part of our projects. I would argue, I would want to argue that our other projects would similarly be excluded from being considered a, uh, being uh, considered an, um, uh, within the scope of Article 17. However, I think we, our concerns remain that, uh, you know, should, should we be found to be included or should uh, additional projects be found within the scope, there is this uh, unresolved tension between what it means to make best efforts to obtain authorization for content that we do not intend to be on our projects. Um, even with Wikimedia Commons, which is devoted to uh, hosting media, um, that it's devoted to hosting media that is either in the public domain or that has been granted uh, uh, a a license, an open license by its creator. Um, and even certain types of Creative Commons licenses would not be permissible under the rules for creators to upload to Wikimedia Commons. Um, so we have no intention of hosting on Wikimedia Commons even uh, perfectly legal works that would be hosted under fair use. Uh, and so the question of what it takes to um, to seek uh, permission for those uses at the same time uh, uh, and make best efforts to obtain those authorizations uh, is an open question. And also what it, what, what it means to, um, 
make best uh, efforts to ensure an availability of works while also trying to ensure that um, that uh, various other provisions are met, such as not preventing, uh, not resulting in prevention of uh, lawful uses being, uh, you know, not, not resulting in the prevention of lawful uses, not leading to uh, general monitoring obligations and so on. Um, Thank you, Mr. Katie. Thank you. <clears throat> so from IFTA's perspective, Article 17, it, it's, it's not perfect legislation. It's the result of a, a very lengthy process. A lot of political compromises were made during that process. But uh, we do take two positives from, from Article 17, the first being that it's premised on getting authorization, the second being that the larger platforms would have to prevent future uploads of notified works. So from that perspective, we are encouraged by Article 17. Uh, we look forward to working with the commission in their, their stakeholder dialogues that will be forthcoming and uh, local implementation uh, throughout the 20. If I can follow up with you, um, given the worldwide nature of your IFTA members and the way you license and finance films, could you say a little bit more about how you see the shall obtain an authorization, especially from the licensing point of view? It's an interesting question, and thank you. Um, and IFTA members license on an exclusive basis, so the premise of these platforms obtaining the authorization may not may not work out. Um, if the members may not want to license these works to, to the platform. So that's some one challenge that we're going to have to face during this process. But um, you're right, it does have the uh, potential to vastly impact the way that members finance their productions. Mr. Lavazar, you may also have comments on the, the authorization point. But yeah, I, your I, turn. yeah, I think one of the beauties of the um, emerging case law and Article 17 is that it creates sort of an, an incentive now for platforms and rights holders to cooperate, um, which is perhaps lacking in the 512 context. Um, so rights holders do want um, works to be available for authors of scientific works to share their work. So we, there, there is ample opportunity now to come up with reasonable, um, with reasonable policies that will not lead to a stifling of freedom of expression or of works that should be available not being available. Um, quite the opposite. STM members for uh, a long time already now use artificial intelligence to deal with plagiarism. And some of you know this uh, from student days, turn it in. But there are many more sophisticated other options and identifiers. And we are very eager to work with the platforms that now have very good incentives to work with us to devise a system that will uh, work for everybody. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of cards up. We're going to go with Mr. McCoy, Mr. Y Ms. Oyama, Ms. Shoyers, Ms. Simpson again, and then back to Ms. McSherry. So almost around the corner. Stan. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Thank you. Uh, I'll take your question as an invitation to expand on t the first two points that I mentioned as uh, criticisms of Article 17. And I should say that uh, we strongly disagree with a lot of the criticisms you're hearing around the table here, but the question here is, you know, what you should look upon as uh, a model, and we do have uh, some concerns about the way this piece of legislation wound up. Uh, one of them is uh, burn inconsistent notification requirements, and here I'm re referring to paragraph four, where the structure says that, uh, that you know, online content sharing service providers shall be liable unless, and then it has some subsidiary requirements, one of which is to act expeditiously upon receiving sub su sufficiently substantiated notice. So you have liability that only kicks in there when a formality has been accomplished. And that, of course, uh, raises concerns under the Berne Convention. Uh, we would have preferred uh, that, uh, along with other AV sector rights holders, that the EU legislator wait until after the, uh, the decision on the YouTube cases that have been referred now, which will squarely address some of the same issues uh, that are uh, in question here. Uh, and uh, the second point that I mentioned was emphasis on licensing over enforcement. I just want to emphasize uh, in my remarks here that uh, for many rights holders, uh, the idea of licensing uh, UGC platforms, for example, is not something they're particularly interested in because they're functioning on exclusive distribution models. Uh, so for those rights holders, the really 
key thing is enforcement. Uh, so, to the, so to the extent that uh, this provision really emphasizes the need to obtain a license, uh, it leaves us a little bit concerned about how it's going to be implemented uh, for the benefit of those rights holders who are really allowing, uh, really relying on the ability to enforce their rights. Uh, uh, although the implementation of filtering solutions along the lines of the sorts of things uh, that uh, that entities like uh, Google already have in place uh, is one you know promising step that we could look forward to here. Thank you, Ms. Oyama. Um, in terms of primary concerns, I think it's like tempting to dive into the weeds, but when we are looking at the EU Copyright Directive, we're first just taking a step back and our primary concern is the conflict between the two frameworks and the potential for conflict. You know, up until now, as um, Mr. Schurz said, there has been relative harmony between the DMCA safe harbors and the e-commerce directive. From the perspective of a service provider, we know that if we're notified by rights holders, notified by our partners, that there is infringement on our platforms, we can then take action. There's a significant shift in the approach that the EU is taking leaving open the possibility for direct liability for a service provider for any type of content that anybody uploads. And that does inject significant confusion, fear, legal risk, and legal uncertainty. Um, one place in particular that we would like to be really focused on in implementation through discussions with policymakers would be making more clear um, what is uh, sufficient notice for a platform to act. Um, in the final version, there were some positive steps taken um, beyond where the parliament had landed, which is this concept that platforms that are making a good faith effort to help rights holders identify and protect works should not face direct liability based on these best efforts. But there is a real need for clarity um, around what those best efforts look like and, and how we work with rights holders and partners. What are their specific URLs? Is there specific information? Um, in the way that we've been able to work, in particular with Content ID, where we can work very collaboratively and understand the intent of rights holders. Um, we've seen a huge benefit from user-uploaded content, user-generated content. Um, if we were at this roundtable you know, five years ago, the idea of users uploading was much more controversial. And even on YouTube, we saw the majority of rights holders, when notified that a user had uploaded content that matched their rights, they would set to block. And now the vast majority choose to leave the content up on the platform and choose to monetize. Um, in fact, on YouTube, more than 50% of revenue that we send out to music rights holders, we've sent more than $6 billion out to the music industry. More than 50% of the revenue that we're sending out is generated from claims against UGC. And so that's the real concern is that this will harm um, not only EU creators, but US creators. Uh, for US creators, more than 68% of their views come from outside of the United States. And so if service providers operating in the EU are so fearful of this direct liability and so uncertain of what it takes for them to act, um, there is a significant risk of, of overblocking this type of content. Thank you. Mr. Schwerz. Thanks. So uh, to summarize my, my primary concern, my answer to the question, in a nutshell, it's, it's a manifestation of the deficiencies of the EU approach in dealing with intermediaries liability for user contact through what is essentially a direct liability lens as opposed to an indirect liability lens. Uh, the way that translates into specific concrete problems is uh, primarily in, in paragraph four of the article which was previously alluded to. Uh, which re requires this obligation to secure a license for effectively all communications on the platform, um, and then to ensure the unavailability of that. While it's worth noting, there are obligations elsewhere in the directive to ensure the availability of particular content, like parodies, but not satires. Um, and, and because there are interpretations of the communication to the public and making available right that, that attach liability at the moment of, of, of availability, uh, then that results in a essentially unmanageable filtering obligation. Uh, and then add on top of that the obligation to prevent the, the future uh, upload of all 
problematic works when the only technologies that are really proven for that, uh, and they are imperfect technologies, pertain to audiovisual works, and yet the, the article is not so similarly circumscribed. And so we have a situation where the system has, uh, the, the legislative proposal has created mandates to implement technologies that have not yet been uh, deployed in the marketplace. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. So going back to address the notion of filtering, I think, yes, there may be concerns about how it is implemented and how well it's done, but frankly, the European Union is all about proportionality and reasonableness of measures, and those standards are already in their law. So when you look at, again, the German case law, um, you, have, you don't have a general obligation to filter or to monitor, but according to that case law, once you have been notified of infringing content on your platform, there does arise the responsibility to take additional measures that prevent the re-upload or the reappearance of the infringing content. So it's not coming out of nowhere. The existence of the obligation or the responsibility is already there. Um, obviously, there are processes that have to be put in place. So as Mr. Schur says, there isn't yet an effective filter for all types of content, but surely the notion of legislation is to get us to that point. So here's a nudge. Maybe we don't all agree with the fact that this law is perfect, and certainly it's not, but you can't just keep saying that we can't do something because there's no framework. The reason you have a framework is to move us towards a direction we can actually find a workable, reasonable, and proportionate solution to the problem. So are you um, in the same, a similar situation like Mr. McCoy or you're where you would have preferred to wait for the court um, in the YouTube case? It sounds like you're, well, you would rather take the directive as it is first. No, Just I first. frankly think that at this point, since the directive isn't law and it may not become law since there is a vote coming up on the 16th of April, I believe, let's not yet look to that as the primary problem. It may become a problem when it is actually adopted and then we have 24 months to see how Either they get it right in certain countries or they mess it up entirely. The case law is there. This directive is supposed to clarify that case law and at least, as Carlo said, maybe codify it. But I do think that one thing that is extremely problematic about probably Article 17 is the fact that it seems to say again that you rights holders, you just have to put up with whatever's being done with your content. And obviously that is contrary to the fundamentals of copyright. You as the creator and you as the distributor have the ability to control or should have the ability to control that content. When that ability is taken from you and then you have no choice but to either monetize it or take it down, that's really moved us far from where copyright is, but that is the world in which we are operating. And so if that is our world, then rights holders do need the requisite, effective, necessary, and adequate tools to combat that problem. Okay, thank you. So we have a lineup. So we're going to Ms. McSherry, then Ms. Wolvers, and then down this line. So Mr. Lamel, Ms. Coffey, Ms. Stratums. So, okay, um, a few quick points. Um, so, so I agree, j just responding to, to Ms. Simpson, that um, copyright holders have lots and lots of, um, uh, have the right in many instances to control how their works are used. But those rights are not unlimited. And that's the part that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the content that's subject to limitations and exceptions, or in, in the United States, if we imported it to fair use, where you don't need a license. So I'm hearing a lot of talk about, well, we'll, we'll just move to a nice licensing regime, and that will be fine. Um, but, when, but there's lots and lots of content that doesn't need to be licensed. You don't need permission. You don't need authorization. And robots are very bad at telling the difference between the content that needs to be licensed and the content that doesn't. So I don't think moving to a licensing regime works for many, many different kinds of content. It may work for some, but it's not, it's not the answer. Um, and I, so, so I want to resist that as, as sort of a, an automatic direction that we should all accept. Um, the second problem I want to make is, or the, the second point I would make is that I would point in the, in the, over the course of the, um, Article 13 being negotiated, there was a lot of back and forth about were filters going to be mandated, were they not? For a while it was like, no, 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 we don't mean filters, it's okay. That's, but then a German regulator just last week said, yes, of course we mean filters. That's, what's, that's what you're going to need to comply with Article 13. So I'd, I'm just resisting a little bit the notion that we're reaching any kind of clarity except for that filtering is going to be required. And that brings me to my third point. Sorry if I'm talking too fast, I'll slow down. Um, we have a competition problem here as well. I'm actually not here to be worried about Google and Facebook. Like them very much, they'll take care of themselves. They'll be fine. 
I'm worried about the people that, for example, Ms. Wolbers represents. I'm worried about the people, the, the platforms that I'd like to see emerge so we can have competition in the space, so we can have competition in the social media space and for other services. I want those platforms to be able to emerge. And the exemptions in, in the exemptions on size really don't satisfy that need. And the reason why is if I'm an investor and I'm looking at a startup, I'm going to ask them, okay, how are you going to comply with Article 13? And if their answer is, well, we'll just never go to Europe, I'm going to say, oh, well, I don't think this is a good investment for me. And so you're going to have to build into your business plan some ability to filter at some point down the line. And not everybody can afford to invest millions of dollars in doing that. Um, so I worry about that as well. Thank you. Um, let's see where we're going to Ms. Wilbers. Corinne just made most of my points for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have a, a few other uh, things that we're concerned about. Um, as Corinne mentioned, I think uh, for small startups, you're really looking at scalability. And if you have con conflicting um, legal regimes, the concept of having to build separate platforms, one for the United States and then maybe, you know, 27 or so other different platforms for each country within the EU is um, not particularly something investors want to see, but it's also not really feasible. And then when you add on the cost of implementing filters, that will be uh, an even greater setback. And so while we've seen in uh, Article 17 um, a, a number of exceptions, and, and I think for startups, you know, it sounds really good, and I know that it's politically very popular to say, oh, we'll just carve out the small guys. Um, but that doesn't actually do startups any service. Um, if you're creating uh, in the Article 17, it's three years old, $10 million in annual turnover, and 5 million monthly active users, it creates these perverse incentives to try to stay under, under those, those numbers. Um, and not grow your company in a more organic way. Um, and then when you're seeing exceptions that were made, and I, I respect my friends over here with Wikimedia and GitHub, but when you're creating in law exceptions for certain companies and industries, you're not really future-proofing your legislation. You are essentially writing in um, companies that will now have an advantage and a leg up in their business model. Um, and my friends at, at Google and Facebook are in similar positions where they now have legislation that's written in a way that helps protect their business models from potential new um, incumbents and competent or new entrants um, and into the marketplace. And so I generally and an engine, we try to avoid these startup exceptions or even exemptions within in the law. So I just want to follow up on that point a little bit. Um, you know, first the comment that you might need 27 different platforms. It seems to me that the purpose of the digital single market is so that you need one platform for Europe. But, you know, I do take the note that if you have to have US, EU, Thailand, China. Um, but to a certain extent, don't we already have that issue? You know, Germany requires you to monitor hate speech. Thailand requires that anything that's derogatory to the king be taken down. Um, in some ways, isn't that just the cost of international um, business? You know, it always was in the analog world that if you went into a country, you had to comply with their safety laws or whatever. So why, why do we treat the internet differently? So uh, that's, that's a great point. Um, and we've worked with a number of much smaller US companies um, like Kickstarter and Bandcamp and SoundCloud who, um, you know, a lot of the content that's being uploaded does not necessarily get into the German hate speech law. It's something that they think about and that their one or two lawyers on staff might flag for um, their trust and safety team. But it's not a fundamental shift in the way that user-generated content is uploaded in the case, in the same way that uh, Article 17 would be. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we still have to have Mr. Lamel, Ms. Coffey, Mr. Adams, and then we have three new folks, Mr. Lavazari, Mr. C, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, 
thank you. So I'll, I'll reiterate what Rachel said that uh, Corinne and now Rachel have said most of what I was going to uh, say and why I put my placard up. Um, I just, you know, I want to, I want to know then, you know, two more things. So I, what, what I will say is, is Corinne perfectly outlined my three biggest concerns uh, with with the legislation. And so, uh, thank you. Uh, but um, adding adding one or two more things to think about. Number one is, you know, not all creators are the same and not all creators create the same, and not all creators want the same thing, and creators want different ways of doing things. And um, very often I come to these roundtables and, 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 and things like this, and I'm frequently saying, you know, there are 17 million people out there who aren't represented right now. Um, and, and the truth is, is there's no organization, I mean, EFF tries to, public knowledge, you know, but there's no trade association or industry association or some sort of, like, form advocating for the 17 million people in the United States who are distributing their content, you know, on these platforms and not through the traditional uh, ways. And again, you know, these are people who are not signed to a record label, aren't, don't have a deal with a major movie studio, et cetera. And so um, I'd just like to note that, like, you know, they're not really present in any of these debates. They really weren't present in Europe. They're not really present here today. Um, Jared uh, Poland was the only one, I think, who, who represented that group today. Um, and, and I think it's important, you know, they, most of them don't have lawyers, they don't have sophisticated understanding of copyright law, like they're just trying to do their thing. Um, this, the second point I want to make, and, 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 and under the European law, those 17 million people in the U.S. are now going to be impacted on reaching their European base and their European customers. And, and as Katie noted, it's the first time I've heard the stat, 65% of, of U.S. users are, are, are overseas, um, of U.S. creators who are using YouTube um, have an overseas audience. I would venture to guess based on population, access to the internet, and other things, a significant part of that is, is in the EU. Um, the second thing I, I, I think that's just exceptionally important to note here is Europe has very, and, 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 and Corinne touched on this, but I think it's really key, U Europe has very, a very different view of issues like fair use than the United States. In over 50% of European countries right now, there's no educa educational exception for digital content. So in other words, if a teacher chooses to show a YouTube clip in their classroom, they are technically violating copyright law in over 50% of EU countries right now. Um, these are things that are like just like basic stuff that we look at in the United States and go, oh, of course we want that. And, you know, I think that brings up the point, and you brought this up, to, you know, to Rachel, when you brought up things like speech, you know, hate speech in Germany, you brought up the King of Thailand. Um, the U.S. should be the place that stands up for human rights around the world. And when you have a Thai government, right, that's saying you can't criticize the king, that is the Thai government violating human rights. And if a U.S. citizen uploads content, a, a, let's say you have an immigrant from Thailand who uploads content um, to uh, a, a, a platform and it's highly critical of the King of Thailand and YouTube or, um, or SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts is to take that, con that content down, um, that is violating the speech rights of someone in the United States. And, and that is something that the U.S. should just be, it, it's just paramount that the U.S. stand up for. And it shouldn't be, you know, well, you are, like, it's the idea that we already do this to comply with these laws, um, yes. Platforms are already doing this to comply with these laws. They have to deal with it. We see the perils of any platform trying to enter China and, 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 and what that means right now. And, and, and you know, that, that, that is um, something the U.S. should stand up for, U.S. companies and U.S. speech and make sure it doesn't happen. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Coffey and then Ms. Yama will be at the end, and then we're going to, kind of after this EU, that's going to close out the EU discussion. We're going to move on to the next thing. So it's Ms. Coffey right now. Thank you. Um, and to switch no, gears. No, no, it's, it's, I'm sorry, we still have the six people. Coffee, Adam, Slavazari, Sai, Shoyers, and Oyama. After those six, we're done with Europe. <laughs> Thank <laughs> well, you. Well, we're still on Europe. Uh, to switch gears a little or, or bit. Or anything you'd like to say. Okay. To switch gears a little bit and talk about the news publisher, right? The Article 11, now Article 15. Um, you asked, how is it affect, going to affect our business in the EU and how is it going to affect our business here? Our business in the EU, that's, that's pretty clear because we represent Axel Springer among other news publishers that have a presence in the EU. So it'll obviously give them a copyright over their news publication that's a compilation that would create efficiencies and parity with um, film and, and television and music that already exists. So um, we're very pleased about that and that's pretty clear cut. Where it becomes a little bit more complicated is when uh, 
with our U.S. publishers and whether or not they have the ability to assert the right in the EU. Um, when it was being discussed in the trilogue, they were talking about um, having language that would restrict it to press publications established in a member state. And there were questions that were raised by the USG who were present in those negotiations as to the reciprocity that would be permitted to the U.S. publishers, um, you know, availing EU, EU publishers being able to avail themselves of the benefits of U.S. regulations and the reciprocity of being able to do the same once EU publishers' right is passed. Um, you know, we weighed in there because if you have a presence in the EU, obviously the national papers would have an easier ability to do that. But here, I think where we should be more concerned and more focused on our, our attention is on the local publications who may not have the presence in the EU but may be more, um, more uh, vulnerable and benefit more from, from this new right. Uh, as it's implemented in the member states, we're all obviously going to work with them uh, in implementation like the other parties here, uh, but that's something that we're certainly going to look at as well as maybe uh, implementing trade regulations that may allow this to apply to U.S. publishers. Thank you. Mr. Adams. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I'll just try to bring it all back to uh, your question, Ms. Strong, about will this impact companies in the United States? And I think uh, playing off of uh, Corinne's points and Rachel's points, it absolutely will. Um, and for some subset of startups at Engine and elsewhere, the decision will not be, well, can I afford to build to all these different legal regimes, but do I want to continue doing business at all? In which case, I'll build to the most stringent one, right? And best case scenario in the EU, that means some sort of authorization program and or filtering, both of which uh, counteract fair use here. I know that's not the same program they have there, but it will impact fair use on platform and users here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lavazari. I just wanted to react to the, to the carve-outs and the intention behind them. I think if you want to, as a startup, you shouldn't uh, build a system that will become a victim of its own success. So it's in, in, in Europe, the, the intention is that if you're business model is to attract customers on the basis of creative works being shared on your platform or you having links uh, or you're working with linking sites, then you better, in fact, um, seek to, to have a, a compliance mechanism early on, not only after the three years grace period. If you're, however, a bakery or a mom and pop shop um, that doesn't principally attract customers through creative works of, of others, then you, you will be quite safe and, and uninhibited from the law. Thank you, Mr. C. Thanks. Um, I did want to touch upon your earlier question about different types of content and sort of why there's a difference between those and copyright. Um, Wikipedias of all languages are banned in Turkey currently, and they're, they're blocked because of a dispute about the characterization of the government of Turkey. Um, so in certain cases, that choice is made based on certain types of restrictions not to operate or to allow ourselves to be blocked in those countries. I think one of the reasons that there is a distinction between the copyright discussion and these discussions is questions of less majesté, hate speech, defamation. They typically aren't um, premised on ex ante uh, actions by the platform. It's something that can only be de determined after the fact since it's not a specific file, it's a specific content of speech uh, that's covered. Um, th that does lead into a another point I did want to make, I promise briefly, um, which is uh, with regard to uh, there a number of um, issues were raised with regard to anonymity and privacy, and it is because um, Wikipedias are available throughout the world and edited by people all over the world that we do take privacy very seriously and we ensure to keep as little uh, personal data and reveal as little personal data about uh, editors in various countries, including restrictive regimes, as possible. And uh, just that the considerations that we are engaging in mostly today on copyright issues do exist within a larger sphere. Just as Packingham is relevant, privacy is relevant as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Thanks. Um, 
so going back to the, the question as to whether or not the, the inconsistent outcome or in, inconsistent implementation of the directive uh, has, has basically taken the single out of the digital single market, and I think that's, that's right, that we've seen what's essentially a, sort of a potential for an anti-federal outcome, uh, which is going to have distributional consequences across industry, as a number of speakers have already uh, caution that, that that concerns me very much representing both large and small firms. I recognize that some will be able to comply with this and others will not. Um, and, and that's going to have, I think, precisely the opposite impact of what EU policymakers uh, want. But more to the general question about whether or not we should just accept it because we already have other similar market access barriers like, like Les Majesty or uh, overly restrictive hate speech policies. Uh, you know, I think the fact that we cannot resolve all access barriers doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried about some, um, you know, particularly because, uh, as Sherwin mentioned, the ex ante implica impl implications, excuse me, of uh, this particular rule set uh, means that simply operating in the marketplace uh, is, um, is prohibited, whereas I think in a lot of other countries, there are services that are available in the marketplace and they deal with these les majesty issues when and if they arise. I'd just you. like to follow up on that. Um, when you're advising uh, smaller companies, how do you advise them to, I don't want to say ignore, but ignore, but ignore other access barriers as opposed to some, like which one, how do you advise which ones to pay attention to and which ones not to? That, that's a, a great question. Um, I'm, I haven't directly advised companies like this in, in over a decade uh, as an association. We're not, you know, legal counsel to these companies. Uh, but I think there is an understanding across industry that, that some of these rules are enforced more in the breach than, uh, you know, holistically. A, a lot of nations, you know, as our, uh, 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 in some cases, uh, 30, 40, 50 page submission to the, the USTR that we make every year about foreign access barriers shows uh, there are a lot of uh, problems that arise from laws on the books uh, that are infrequently enforced. Um, and so there's a great amount of uncertainty around that. Uh, but they are all ex post enforcement. And so the reality is, is it is possible for uh, services to be available in a marketplace until the government gets around to blocking them. And in some cases, that simply doesn't happen. You know, fortuitously, there are services where content that might, in theory, violate less majesty laws uh, are operating in nations that have such laws. Uh, this is a different scenario where you, you have to meet the technological mandate uh, almost as soon as you're in the market or as soon as your user base spikes over 5 million because you had one piece of content that went viral. Um, thank you. The last question for EU goes to Ms. Oyama. The next subject, get ready for your questions and answers, will be on injunctions. Thanks. Um, just a quick point kind of on the practical implications sitting um, as a service provider to respond to one of the questions about recognizing kind of different categories of speech. Um, the way that our systems would view that, that is different. It is a different um, aspect of the technology to and as in addition to human reviewers, to recognize that speech is hate speech or to recognize that speech is insulting the king, that is a different process than recognizing whether a piece of content is licensed or not. And we're living in a day and age where there's so much content created. You know, every single individual or user is the creator of a copyrighted work and there is no place today to find, you know, authoritative, comprehensive, rights ownership information. And so that's the place where the collaboration and um, specific uh, information is really necessary so that the service provider would know if something is licensed or not. We have experiences all the time with music where um, we may be able to complete, you know, 95% of the rights ownership um, chart uh, between different publishers and different labels, but it's very common that there is a sliver that's still undefined or contested and if the default is to stay down anytime there's imperfect information, that's gonna be a very um, very high occurrence. And then just the last piece on Article 11, because I know that didn't get quite as much time. Um, ensuring that news publishers do still have control and have the ability to decide you know, whether 
on our service, they have the ability to be out of search if they want, but also if they do want to appear um, in news aggregation, that's also important. We have really good examples in Europe looking at ancillary copyright regimes in Germany and Spain to understand um, what types of options uh, give news publishers maximum control and which ones, when their rights are um, not waivable, can lead to unintended uh, consequences that are you know, later regretted across the board. Um, does anyone else have a final word? I don't see any more tags. So we're going to switch to um, the issue of injunctions. And according to some reports, um, we've seen that uh, anywhere over over 40 countries have adopted or implemented or are obliged to adopt and implement um, measures for ISPs to take steps to disable access to infringing websites. And by this, I mean this is often accomplished through court orders for site blocking, and it can address either you know, the, the URL or the IP the protocol address or the, the DNS blocking. But you know, I'm looking for information or your views and experiences on perhaps what seems to be a recent trend from other countries outside the U.S. to be using this remedy of an injunctive relief to uh, attack a specific problem, and I'm going to limit it only for copyrighted content. I, wanna, I understand there may be some overblocking issues, but um, to the extent there are more than three dozen countries around the world, most recently, and it appeared in our notice, uh, Australia passed a copyright amendment to its copyright law that would provide copyright owners with this tool. So I'm, I welcome the floor is open for views on the uh, effectiveness or non-effectiveness of that kind of a remedy. Mr. McCoy. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, this is uh, an EU model that we strongly support. And the fact that uh, this model has been, you know, has inspired the adoption of similar regimes for injunctive relief in uh, countries around the world is a uh, testament to uh, its effectiveness. This has been, you know, Article, Article 8.3 has been in place now uh, for, uh, for 18 years. Uh, it's uh, functioning well. Uh, none of the dire consequences that have sometimes been uh, forecasted around uh, injunctive relief measures like this uh, have come to pass. Uh, and I want to emphasize uh, for this audience in particular the complementarity of a uh, injunctive relief regime to the goals of a notice and takedown regime. Uh, because you can really, uh, by what the EU experience illustrates, is having those two things functioning in parallel with one another uh, can really give you a, a flexibility of tools to address uh, the underlying problems of piracy, uh, where you know certain types of particularly egregious actors uh, are ready targets for a uh, for an injunctive relief action uh, under Article 8.3. So my only criticism related to Article 8.3 in the European context would be the lack of complete implementation of Article 8.3 across the member states. There are still some EU member states where 18 years later the remedy has not been properly implemented. But aside from that, where it is up and running as intended and the implementations of it, of course, are tailored to national law and national systems as, as is appropriate, uh, we've found the remedy to be a, a very good one. Uh, not, always, uh, not always perfect, uh, not always perfectly implemented, uh, but highly dissuasive in terms of interfering with access to legitimate content. I think it's very uh, important that we emphasize that you know, this is by no means cutting off consumers' access uh, to, legitimate, uh, uh, to legitimate sources of uh, film and television content, of which there are now very, very many. Uh, this is rather you know, redirecting them from piratical sources towards the many legitimate sources that are available there in the marketplace. So this is something that's working well. We're glad to see it being picked up in other parts of the world, uh, and we are major users of the remedy where it exists. Um, just a, a question to the to the table. Um, has anyone noticed any increased use of injunctions in those territories where there is not a notice and takedown system? I mean, apart from Europe and the U.S. and, and obviously there's a couple countries in Asia that have a kind of a notice and takedown system. Um, it seems that the use of injunction actually 
is being used by courts regardless of whether there's a notice system. So I'm just curious if, if anyone has any experience. And while you're thinking about that, I'll go to Ms. Simpson. I think, well, I agree with all the points that Mr. McCoy raised. For the publishers, we've certainly taken advantage of the remedy in Europe, as I mentioned in my opening text. We have uh, pursued the remedy successfully in six European countries, and the, the main goal of these website blocking injunctions is really to disrupt the availability of that service in that particular country. I will note that because it is of limited jurisdiction, there are limits to the effectiveness of this particular remedy. Obviously, a site, when it is blocked on a particular or within a particular jurisdiction, sometimes the operator of that website will simply try and move to a different server. What has progressed in Europe is they've now expanded the availability of those injunctions so that you don't have to redo the entire process. The orders themselves can be amended so that the new sites that have come up as a, as a way of masking the original um, identifier site can then be included in the previous order so that rights holders don't have to engage in that long process of seeking that injunction. I think for objections that these injunctions might be broad, um, the court processes or the administrative processes that are in place actually are very rigorous and rights holders themselves have been rigorous in, the, in identifying which actually are viable targets under this particular model. So the notion that it could be abused, we haven't seen that and I think rights holders themselves would be very careful with respect to how they bring these um, actions because as everyone knows we are all of course very budgetarily limited and so bringing an action that doesn't really result in anything is something that we would not be likely to do. And as to the second question of whether we've seen it coupled with a notice and takedown system, I, I don't think we necessarily have. I think in jurisdictions where the statute has been made available, whether it's through a court or through an administrative process, um, if the country has define that this is actually a worthwhile tool to make available to rights holders, um, the, the availability of a notice and takedown system doesn't really need to be accounted for in this framework. Ms. Wayama. I think when you're talking at a global scale, it's hard to say that we never see cases of abuse. It, you know, there are certain um, remedies that even if they work many times, there are, you know, instances of abuse where legitimate sites are. Um, targeted on the um, Australian implementation, um, I believe it's a recently, you know, passed measure. So I don't actually think that any orders. I'm not aware of any orders that have actually been issued under the new law yet. Um, I did just want to mention one approach um, that we've taken in search that does kind of run parallel to uh, site blocking regimes. Um, in our view, for search, they have benefits of being more scalable. Um, so just as a practical matter, if there is a site blocking order um, that an ISP receives, even if a link were to show up in search, if a user were to click on the link, they wouldn't um, actually ever be able to access the site. Um, but another measure that we did announce is the search um, ranking demotion signal, um, which does work with the DMCA. So when rights holders are sending to Google search, um, DMCA notices that will have an effect on the ranking. Um, and we have demoted more than 66,000 sites in search. Um, on average, the amount of traffic from Google um, that has been reduced is about 90%. I think we're adding about um, 500 new uh, sites to that a week. And in my discussions with rights holders, one of the benefits they've seen is that these um, suppressions do apply globally um, rather than country by country. So yeah, I was just going to ask you that. The, the demotion does apply to Google websites around the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. McCoy. Yeah. <clears throat> just picking up on that topic, I can confirm from the from the MPA perspective that the, some of the enhancements that Google has made to demotion on a global basis have been uh, have had a noticeable impact. So it's a positive development that uh, that's uh, that's certainly uh, worth confirming. Uh, in in regard, I wanted to speak to your question about whether there's any uh, w w whether there's any sort of link between <clears throat> the presence or absence of notice and takedown and uh, and and whether site blocking is used. In in a, in a market. 
I don't know empirically of any uh, data that speaks to that. I'll certainly go back and inquire with my, uh, with my colleagues uh, who know more about the data and see if we can get you any data uh, that would help on that. One point to bear in mind is, you know, the panels this morning drew out some of the experience on the expense of notice and takedown. And, you know, consequently, rights holders are selective about what markets and systems they will target for uh, notice and takedown. Down. So, in some cases, uh, the availability of a uh, the availability of an injunctive relief remedy uh, might provide an alternative way of uh, addressing the worst of the worst pirate sites in markets where a notice and takedown rep that weren't a high priority for uh, for notice and takedown. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, as a sort of a segue, I've also heard that um, in other countries, Mexico comes to mind which does not have a notice and takedown system and, and doesn't exactly have a secondary liability system that applies um, in this space, that, they, that some ISPs are honoring basically the equivalence of notice and takedowns being sent to Mexican ISPs, kind of a la the US style on a very informal basis. And I would assume that that is happening in a couple of other countries. Can anyone here speak to that experience where a sort of an informal notice and takedown, uh, maybe it's not exactly a cease and desist order, but a notice that are being recognized by ISPs in locations that do not have a formalized system. Mr. Shores. Yeah, so I, I, that's a very, uh, it's a helpful observation um, because, you know, for a long time before the, the Canadian system was implemented uh, some years ago, there was a, a, an informal inter-industry agreement uh, that, that enabled notice uh, forwarding primarily, um, which is what rights holders in that marketplace wanted. Um, and it, it, it was widely adopted. I, we've also seen that happen in other markets where intermediaries uh, don't want their services and environments to be perceived as, uh, as a you know, a, a venue for, for misuse, and so they do, they do work on this. Uh, one of the benefits of that approach is that it allows the more capable services to invest more uh, substantially in, in that kind of compliance, whereas startups, obviously, that don't have the resources, you know, do what they can. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's just important to take away that the absence of uh, a particular statutory mandate doesn't mean that services aren't implementing uh, misuse and, and misconduct policies to prevent infringement where they can. Yeah, I think that was my question, was what there are examples of that kind of informality that actually is in place. Ms. Simpson. Well, it's not to the notice and takedown point, but when we were successful in obtaining an injunction against Sci-Hub in the District Court of New York, strangely enough, a Chinese website or Chinese operator actually, on the basis of reciprocity, said we'll recognize that judgment and did block the site in China, or at least on its, um, to its subscribers. So it, I guess the point that you need not have a mandate in place is plausible, but obviously if one isn't in place, there are so many loopholes through which an ISP can act that it will choose not to do something if there isn't an obligation to do something. C could you explain a little bit more about how the Chinese recognize the judgment? Well, we sent the copy of the, of the judgment to the Chinese operator and Frankly, two days later, the site was just not available on that um, to the subscribers of that particular uh, operator or that service. There was no formal process in place, but I it think it was totally informal. <laughs> you didn't go through like a hate no, convention. We just, no, we just sent them the notice and said, "FYI, this has been adjudged a notoriously infringing site. Um, you should not have it on your service, and if you would like, please take it down or at least block access to it." And they did. Has, has anyone else had a similar experience in the either ease or difficulty of getting a judgment, uh, for perhaps of injunctive relief, recognized outside the, the originating jurisdiction? Just curious. I guess I should add, I don't want to make it seem that that was easy. Those are few and far between instances. <laughs> I, I thought I'd follow up. <laughs> Um, as we're talking about website, website blocking, uh, Canada comes up and the CRTC recently denied um, Fair Play's ap application for website blocking regime, and they said that alternative avenues were available. Um, anyone would like to speak about what those alternative avenues are um, and how they, if they dis disagree or agree with the CRTC uh, decision?
We, we can level it up a little bit and maybe ask, uh, does anyone have any views on Canada's implementation of its notice and notice regime that went into effect in 2015? Um, it's a Canada question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Louis, um, Simpson. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I wasn't going to speak to the Canada element <laughs> oh. of it, so. I guess I'll just go ahead and say, on the Canada situation, we obviously think that the notice and notice system is, as someone has said before, a notice and nothing system, because frankly, you send the notices forward, but do you ever really hear of anything being uh, taken down? Um, in the past, there were some, I guess, private cooperation agreements that were favorable to rights holders in the sense that something was being done. But on the notion that notice and notice alone will accomplish anything, I think we've seen, frankly, that it doesn't. I mean, if we're having problems with the notice and takedown system, think of what a notice and notice does, and which is, frankly, nothing. Thank you. Um, this is a, a good transition to one of the earlier points I'd meant at the beginning to talk about, and it has to do with um, what your experiences are in seeing the kinds of cooperation between ISPs and content holders at the local level. As we've spoke all this morning and, you know, the intent of the DMCA is to incentivize that kind of cooperation between these two groups. Um, we really appreciate hearing your experiences at the local level. How are or are not local ISPs working with both your local rights holders? We, we can start by region, or Stan can start. Thank you. <laughs> well, just to get things moving, I would say at the local level uh, in Europe, uh, which is uh, where I'll begin here, uh, we find that in a lot of territories, uh, the ISPs, uh, as content becomes more and more important to their business models, uh, are more and more interested in finding ways to work constructively with uh, IP owners uh, to implement uh, anti-piracy solutions. Uh, one uh, important example of that is in the field of uh, in, in the field of uh, implementing uh, injunctive relief under Article 8.3 of the directive. So we have several uh, jurisdictions, Belgium is one to, that comes to mind, uh, where we've been able to achieve good voluntary arrangements with ISPs, uh, not to bypass the, uh, the adjudication process around injunctive relief, but rather to, uh, to uh, treat aspects of that process uh, as non-opposed uh, for cases that meet certain threshold requirements. Uh, uh, and that, uh, we find, can be a way to reduce the overall cost of implementing an injunctive relief solution, uh, both for the ISPs uh, and for the rights holders. Thank you. Uh, we'll go with Mr. Adams, Mr. Cady, Mr. Lamel. Thank you. I just wanted to contribute a more technical observation regarding ISP's compliance with uh, various legal mandates such as copyright protection um, and to the site blocking thing as well in that where implementations of site blocking are DNS based, um, the DNS resolver market is undergoing, let's say, significant changes currently um, in that as more private operators enter the DNS scene uh, supporting DNS over HTTPS in particular and more people move to those, it reduces the visibility of ISPs into DNS traffic at all. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mr. Kitty. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'll contribute more of a practical uh, contribution. We uh, and have to recognize the importance of cooperation, but um, legislative change is, is fundamental to, to our members having access to effective measures. Our observation has been that without government oversight and full participation in any voluntary program, the benefits simply don't reach independence. Um, and in practice, have not offered any effective mechanism to stop um, any specific instances of illegal activity. And moreover, um, historically, these agreements have been cost prohibitive. Thank you. Mr. Lamel. 
I just um, I, I, I just want to note here and, and, and talk about something just primarily from the user perspective and the consumer perspective in the United States, which is um, when you're looking at ISP level blocking, the United States does not exactly have the most competitive broadband uh, and ISP marketplace out there. For many consumers, they only have one choice um, for an ISP in the marketplace. And I think um, within the context of, of, of markets and how these things work, I think that's something really important to take into account is to look at, at, at competition in, in, in the ISP marketplace globally. And, and specifically, um, as you look towards the US, com US marketplace, the lack of competition in that marketplace for most consumers. Thank, thank you. Um, just to follow on another question, I think Mr. Kitty sort of suggested, um, there are a couple of countries out there that have uh, administrative systems where rights holders, usually under the color of a code or a statute, uh, are able to come together and help streamline the, the evaluation process for a notice. So, for example, the what is happening in Japan and in a different way, what's happening in Korea comes together, and those are obviously unique legal situations, um, but both countries have actually quite advanced copyright laws, liability systems, notice and takedowns, and a very um, active ISP community. And So I was wondering, does anyone have any views on how those systems are operating with respect to addressing, you know, infringement in the online environment, and especially via the use of notices? Ms. Wolpers. Um, so in a number of the platforms, uh, the smaller platforms that we work with, um, they provide it, and when we've talked to them about DMCA, um, the amount of notices that they receive, what types of notices that they've received, um, almost all of the, the smaller platforms that I'm thinking of, there are about 10 um, that have all signed, that signed our Article 13, Article 17 letter, um, all provide uh, dispute, internal dispute resolution uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms, um, for instance, uh, Patreon, uh, many times a rights holder will upload something to Patreon and occasionally dispute with another Patreon creator about, you know, whose copyright it is. And, and I think that while company, or countries may have more flexible um, not, uh, processes to deal with this, we do see a lot of companies taking that initiative to allow rights holders to dispute and settle their differences um, uh, on the platform rather than having to resort to the legal system, which for many small creators is prohibitively costly and is not an avenue that most small creators are going to pursue, um, no matter if it's our legal system or, you know, maybe the legal system of Japan or wherever it may be. I think a lot of platforms are offering those dispute me re resolution mechanisms within their platforms themselves. Um, Mr. Church. So, uh, I, with the exception of uh, a few cases, I think we, we should be um, wary of assuming that uh, inter-industry um, standard setting, for example, is something that's, that's, that's viable at scale, in part because there's so much heterogeneity across uh, Internet services and how they function. Uh, and so if you look at social media platforms versus host, just even within social media, they're uh, highly unique in how they're structured. And so uh, the frameworks that might work for one are not necessarily going to work for another. Uh, I know for some years there was a, a basically a notice forwarding system here in the United States between rights holders and, and broadband providers, which uh, is at least plausible because of the homogeneity on both sides of the equation there. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily scale beyond the, the broadband s sector into uh, internet services that are highly differentiated and, and new ways of, of uh, sharing both the user's content and, and third party content evolve all the time. Uh, and so there's always a risk that if, uh, you know, domestic rights holders and, and certain domestic industries get together, there are going to be standards written with, with that don't have sort of U.S. exporters' uh, products in mind uh, and may have, may, may function as uh, in a sort of ex exclusionary manner. It's something we should be mindful of before endorsing any particular framework. Um, thank you. Mr. McCoy. Thank you. Uh, concerning administrative systems, 
uh, and how well, how well they function. Uh, I don't have any notes with me on uh, Japan and Korea, so I'm happy to come back come back to you at a later date about that. But uh, the, I certainly uh, have some experience of dealing with the administrative systems that exist to implement Article 8.3 in Europe. Uh, Italy and Portugal would be two examples of that. Uh, and the uh, you know the overarching important thing for us is that injunctive relief is uh, is accomplished in a manner that's uh, consonant with the rule of law. Uh, and often that means judici judicial oversight. Uh, in some systems, like the systems in Italy and Portugal, uh, the appropriate implementation has been an implementation uh, by an administrative agency, which itself is subject to judicial oversight. So it's very much a creature of the national national system in terms of how the rule of law is best implemented in the context of that system. But, uh, but having, the, you know, uh, uh, having the rule of law dimension, that oversight is important to a uh, viable injunctive uh, relief system. And we do find that, uh, that, uh, that those systems in uh, Italy and Portugal uh, are working well. Uh, with the possible exception that uh, that uh, you know those are both systems that, to my knowledge, are still focused on uh, blocking on uh, on uh, DNS blocking rather than IP blocking, and that is a technical uh, that is a technical detail that matters to the effectiveness of the overall remedy. But even uh, even DNS blocking, uh, our you know our analyses have suggested, uh, is uh, it, it contributes greatly to uh, 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 the dis you know, dissuading the ordinary uh, consumer uh, from going to pirate sites rather than legitimate services. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Simpson? I was just going to go back and address a point Mr. Schur has raised about, and I think it was raised throughout the day, that one size solution does not fit all, and that's absolutely true. Perhaps the problem is that we do not have an adequate definition in the statute about what is an internet service provider versus what is an online service provider? Because if you are a mere ISP, meaning you manage the pipes, and I think your responsibilities will be very different from what an OSP should be, and that OSP could cover uh, s share hoster sites, could cover social media sites. So perhaps that is a question that the Copyright Office can look at more closely of whether there does need to be a parsing out of what these different types of intermediaries really are and if there are different types of intermediaries, what are the appropriate responsibilities that should be crafted on to that particular platform or infrastructure? Thank you. Um, I just note we're starting to run out of time. I have one more question, and then if you have any last observations um, that we can make within the time frame, we will. If not, I open mic is going to follow directly after this. And my question is, we spent a lot of time in the prior sessions uh, about uh, the repeat infringer policy. And to the extent there seems to be, on behalf of some folks, some interest in having the certainties of 512 outside the borders of the United States, I'm curious to know, for those people who want that, when you are looking at you know, a 512 outside the US, um, do you and your company support the implementation or an, ob an obligation to have a repeat infringer policy? Uh, because I think we've seen in some countries outside the US, they tend to take the phrase repeat infringer, meaning adjudicated infringer prior court, you know, by a court. So I'm just curious to know uh, if anyone has views on implementation of repeat infringer policies outside the US. Or maybe I answered my own question. <laughs> uh, Ms. Simpson. So um, I think it's very important that given how a notice and takedown system does have to work efficiently and expeditiously, to have an adjudicated infringer or repeat infringer requirement simply does away with that. Because if you have to go to court to then have this, this particular individual or operator judged a repeat infringer, the material that you're seeking to be brought down because it is in fact infringing, it's been available for what, more than 24 hours, more than a week before you even get that order. So to me, the notion that a repeat infringer must be adjudicated in the court of law simply will strip out the, frankly, what even makes the notice and takedown system workable. It's not workable now, but if you include that particular requirement, I think you're not gonna have a system that actually does anything for the rights holder. Um, on that point though, is it necessary to go to court before sending a notice and takedown? Couldn't you do both in conjunction with each other? 
I suppose yes, you would. I mean, your your goal is to notify the ISP or the OSP that there is material on their system that is actually infringing your rights. If they come back to you and say it must be adjudicated, perhaps you do need to do that. But the goal is to notify that particular actor that you are actually facilitating infringement, and that could perhaps lead to another cause of action for you. But if they come back to you and say, you've not actually shown us that there has been adjudication of whether this particular infringer is a repeat infringer, that does present problems for rights holders. Mr. Schurz. So I, I think it's, it's important to distinguish between what the statute says and, and what happens in practice. Um, you know, the statute says repeat infringer. It doesn't say repeat alleged infringer. I'm aware that some courts have interpreted that differently, but the language of the section is the language of the section. But that being said, I'd say many online services uh, operate uh, a, a far more strict process f that, that functionally encompasses uh, repeat accused infringers. And, and that's, I think, very reasonable because it, in a, an arm's length relationship in the private sector, if you have a user who's causing a lot of uh, problems, who is the source of, of complaints, it's entirely reasonable that, that uh, an intermediary might want to discontinue service to a, a troublesome user. And so under the terms of use of most services, I, you know, I, I, I'd say many online uh, services terminate users long before the statutory definition comes into play. That the, I think that we shouldn't, though, think that that changes what the statutory definition actually says. It, it, it says repeat infringer. Um, but, but frankly speaking, that's not what's really always all that relevant in the marketplace. Ms. Sherry. So I think when we're, when we're thinking about this issue, we have to realize a couple of things. Um, one is that um, the world has changed in the past two decades, and people are reliant upon their internet service in a way that they weren't two decades ago, such that it's, it's really fundamental to so many different things in a household. Right, so the fact that there might be someone in a household who's engaging in infringing activity to um, impose the punishment of cutting off internet access for that household will have very, very severe consequences. And that's just the w reality nowadays. And, and it, I think it has to change how we think about the issue. Um, and uh, secondly, getting back to uh, Mr. Lamel's point, it's also true that here in the United States anyway, we don't have a lot of choices for service, for internet service, for particularly high-speed internet access service. So really, I think um, the, our approach to repeat infringement you know, really needs a fundamental rethink. And I think trying to embrace a notion that we should make it easier to terminate um, people's internet access, I, I think would be a, a, a cause far too many unintended con consequences and collateral damage. Um, far beyond speech, <laughs> far beyond speech, but just for people's ability to, to work and get educated and, and so on. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you. Um, I want to make one, I guess, general point that touches on what you just raised, but also uh, the dis first part of the discussion on EU and taking off of Ms. McSherry's point that, you know, I think probably the strongest policy justifications for some kind of ISP safe harbor um, you know, have, that have been raised are certainly the critical access issue, the fact that to participate in today's society, you have to have access to the internet. Um, and then I think you know, the, the argument that's been made historically that uh, to, to promote innovation among startups, struggling new entrants in the market, they need some kind of, of protection from liability um, but I think, I think th those two justifications for a safe harbor, you know, apply to online access providers, what I would call, you know, folks who help you get onto the internet, not to uh, uh, UGC sites, not to uh, digital media services online, not to basically anyone except someone who actually enables you to access the internet. And the startup point is one that, that I take as a real point. But again, once a provider has a $500 billion market cap and $100 billion in the bank, you don't, you don't deserve that kind of protection anymore. And I think, you know, as I understood the goal of, of, of this whole day was to, you know, incorporate into y'all's uh, report possibly any ideas for congressional uh, legislation in this area, you know, I'd say that the important insights from Article 
thirteen seventeen is that uh, that that approach was incredibly narrow. It only applies to for profit UGC sites that are consumer oriented. And in that very narrow context, even there, it says if you're a startup, basically, you don't have the types of obligations that they found to be onerous, that large players will be treated differently than small players. I think that framework, that idea, is something that would be useful to bring into U.S. law, to, to ask the idea of if core Internet access issues aren't on the table and we're talking about sites online that make their money off of exploiting copyrighted works, even if they're works that users have put on there, should large players have the obligations that Europe is putting out and should small players be treated differently until they become large players? And if they've made that affirmative decision that they want to be large, well, maybe they do have some more responsibilities then. But that, that's my, my takeaway from, you know, what you all should be thinking about and recommending to Congress. Thank you, Mr. Lamel. And then the final word goes to Ms. Bolmer. So it's come up in, in, in a lot in the context, and, and, and Corinne just brought it up again, which is the idea that these conversations around copyright policy are happening around a broader conversation around internet policy generally, and it's very hard to just look at something from the context of copyright policy in today's world. Right? A decision like repeat infringer policy has an impact on basic economic policy for that person and their ability to participate in the economy, participate in our democracy, if you see the internet as an important place for um, democratic participation, and all sorts of other policy implications that go far beyond the jurisdiction of the Copyright Office. We heard earlier a, a conversation, which hasn't been discussed since, but brought up who is in, within the context of privacy and cybersecurity policy, right? And, and, and decisions that we might be possibly making and thinking about from the perspective of a copyright professional, there might be there are really important and other issues that come into play in these things from the context of privacy, which Stan Adams brought up, or, or cybersecurity, uh, economic policy more generally. And I just think it's important that at this juncture there's, there's a no notation made that this conversation goes beyond just copyright policy as we look at all these other things. And it, it, it's something that the office should take into account. Thank you, Ms. Fulmer. Um, I just wanted to on some of the comments. Um, oh. Uh, one thing to note, um, as I mentioned, I was you know in touch with policymakers in Brussels, and when the SME exception was um, the, the final one between France and Germany was proposed, one of the lead negotiators made the point that she asked, you know, is there anybody who actually fits um, within this exception? So it may sound nice to have you know these three categories, and if you meet them, you're you're preserved. But in reality, people are sort of hard pressed to find it, an example that actually works there. So I mean. I would just recommend some caution in, in just trying to take that concept and really making sure it's it's effective. Um, also, you know, the idea of access to the internet, um, you know, it's really not just about who controls the pipes. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, we have software developers building all sorts of programs, apps, websites on our platform, 31 million users, 100 million different projects, all sectors. I mean, software is everywhere. So if you think about, you know, cutting into people's ability to collaboratively build that software, um, that's, that's a really serious impact, and it's not just about can you access this website or not. On this, um, on this point about access, um, can I just ask, I mean, do you, you know, and we've had a lot of people sort of um, invoke that concern, which obviously is, is very serious, but I mean, do you, do you see that concern mitigated at all by the fact that, you know, this is a voluntary system uh, as part of which ISPs are you know, have the choice whether or not to participate, but if they do choose to participate, they're afforded really quite a significant benefit, right? I mean, they, they have um, a limitation against monetary liability. And in exchange for that benefit, they're asked to do something that um, is, that, you know, that we think should be regulated because it's against their economic interest, right? They need to, I mean, it's not in, as we saw in Cox, it's not in their economic interest to terminate customers who are repeat infringers. So we want to make that um, part of the legal framework. I mean, it, it, so does that sort of, I don't know, to me, you know, is, is there sort of a response that this concern about cutting people off from the internet is sort of mitigated by the fact that this is sort of something that ISPs are, are choosing uh, to engage in uh, with the expectation that they'll be provided a legal benefit? Sure. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I think we're going to be going a little longer, Mr. Wolbers, and then we'll just go straight down the line. Um, who has things up? So that's going to be Mr. C. Shoppers. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess you know I, I get your point about it being voluntary, but I don't see the the cost of you know access going away being the fair collateral damage there. I think the point that I was trying to make is that the goal of notice and takedown is trying to find a way to prevent infringement. I mean, we don't want to have infringers on our platform either, and so sure we're voluntarily taking voluntarily taking steps to help make that happen. But I think the cost of even like earlier this morning we were talking about counter notice, I mean, that exists, but the amount of counter notices that we get is such a small fraction compared to the takedown notices for a bunch of reasons that were mentioned this morning. Um, and I think, you know, to assume that if something comes off, that there are mechanisms there that bring it back up, I mean, that's something, but it's really a cost when something comes down and it might not get back up. Maybe the counter notice isn't going to be effective. Maybe the person's not going to know to do it. So that was more my point, that I feel like the access is something that we should really there's gravity there when you remove access. Thank you, Mr. C. Um, I, I think just from a practical <coughs> matter, it's uh, the idea that it's vol a voluntary system is uh, not, it's not something that is practically voluntary uh, if the alternative is to subject ourselves to strict liability copyright regime with statutory damages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think it's, and in terms of the distinction between uh, an ISP and an OSP, as an OSP that provides a, what we like to think of as a public service. Uh, we like to think that this ability to provide that access and, uh, to knowledge and free knowledge is something that matters despite the fact that we are not a conduit. Thank you, Mr. Sher. Well, so I, I think two things that, that Sherwin touched on, the, the, the need to distinguish between what we would think of as sort of 512A services and, and 512B through D services, and then the e-commerce e directive makes a, a somewhat similar distinction, right? The, the calculus for those two constituencies is, I think, quite different uh, and, and reasonably so. And so we, uh, we shouldn't necessarily, um, you know, ask 512B B through D businesses about the incentives for 512A businesses, you know, and actually I think, well, they may have been represented earlier today, aren't, aren't actually on this panel, that is to say the, the sort of OSPs, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, ISPs, the, uh, the, the mere conduits, if you will. Right? I think that's a very different calculus that, that should be, and that question should be presented to that constituency. Mr. Lamel, and then Mr. McCoy has the final word. So, and really. <laughs> for, for, first of all, I think, you know, my ISP competition point comes in really key here, that if most users only have a choice of one or two ISPs as their ISP, there is the third party to this conversation, which is consumers, which are important. I think, second of all, and even more importantly, we're seeing an integration between the ISP business model and the content business model. And you have to take that into account in the economic incentive conversation around this. You can make a legitimate argument that the two largest ISPs in this country right now, and I don't know exactly what market share are, are members of MPAA right now um, because of their holding um, in Comcast and AT&T now. And so you also have to take into account that we're seeing this massive integration between the ISP business model and the content creation business model and these traditional methods um, in a way that that economic incentive is going away. And Mr. McCoy. Yeah, the whole point about the uh, about not taking away access to the internet kind of it speaks to this the larger balancing of interests that has to take take place here. And I just wanted to commend to you the 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 jurisprudence in Europe on these issues because the European Court of Justice and subsidiary courts in Europe uh, have taken very seriously their obligation to weigh the different rights uh, at stake uh, in these cases, uh, including, for example, in the UPC, tele uh, in the UPC telecable case uh, that uh, in 2014 that involved uh, uh, an early application of uh, injunctive relief uh, in an ISP context. So uh, what you find there is, the, is, you know, courts carefully weighing these different interests uh, in the Europe in the context of European legislation and uh, concluding that uh, indeed site blocking that meets uh, certain basic criteria uh, is uh, consistent with fundamental rights. 
Okay, um, with that, I think we're going to conclude the official roundtable portion, um, and we're gonna open up the open mic. If you've signed up to speak at the open mic, start making your way over here. Unfortunately, we cannot move the mic stand. Um, if you haven't signed up and you want to, find Brad. Um, just one thing to keep in mind, it is now 4.41. Um, how long you talk will determine how long you have to stay. Uh, and those of you sitting at the table can stay if you'd like. It's, stay seated where you are. That's fine. You can be comfortable. Thank you all. I'm going to stay here. I, I did leave behind uh, like three or four additional sheets, so up to another 80 people, I think, can sign up, although I can't guarantee time for all of those. So if I could just ask the rest of the room to uh, kind of quiet down so we can get started with those who have already lined up. Uh, feel free to uh, walk to the back if you do want to add your name to the list, but we are on a time crunch here, so we do want to get started with uh, Janice Pilch. Hello. Um, is this going? No? My name is Janice Pilch. I am a faculty librarian at Rutgers University in New Jersey, but speaking as a member of the public in my personal capacity. I'd like to comment on both of the topics being discussed today. First, domestically it seems obvious and has been, re been reinforced today that litigation on Section 512 cannot change the systemic problem of infringement, disregard by service providers and their users for the rights of others, interference with the markets for works, and the impossibility for most rights holders to undertake expensive prolonged litigation. Section 512 sets up a permanent conflict between service providers and rights holders that case law can only act out unsuccessfully, too often in legal arguments that protect and increase the wealth of service providers. This, to me, is an illusion of balance. The conflict won't end until Section 512 is amended to create a functional balance, to effectively give creative people and other rights holders their rights back and not make that the responsibility of the courts. I hope that the Copyright Office will, will make that recommendation. And secondly, internationally, the same conflict plays out between efforts to create laws that are fairer to all members of the public, such as the laws envisioned by the new EU directive that will hold all platforms that bring works to the public more equally responsible for their content, and on the other hand, the drive by private internet and technology corporations, some of the richest and most privileged corporations in the world, to fight laws that would constrain their profit from user-generated content. That their war on rights is often waged by corporate-backed activists posing as public advocates is a problem that has become global. It's become more clear in the past several years how some private technology companies are using their dominant economic position, a position made possible in part by the flaws in Section 512, to distort public perception of law and the legislative process through influence campaigns, coalition building, funding, misinformation, and technological disruption. We see fleets of academics, law school centers and programs, NGOs, nonprofit and civil society organizations, internet users, professional associations, and others paid or otherwise motivated toward coordinated action that creates an illusion of public interest support and supporting logic for specific corporate interests. These groups pride themselves on the power of their coalitions, employing tactics from rhetoric, linguistic play, misinformation, confusion, omission of fact, flipping of definitions, to censorship and threats to those with opposing views, to infiltration of lawmaking bodies, and hacking of information systems. 
It's commonly known that a technical war was waged on the EU Copyright Directive and that the US Copyright Office itself was compromised in 2016 on the day that written comments on Section 512 were due, crashing the system and making it difficult for people to file real comments before the are, deadline. Are you contending that certain people were not able to file comments? Um, there were delays because of the interruptions involving nine, roughly 90,000, yeah. um, we think, bought submissions. Okay, I think we think that everyone who wanted to file a comment was able to do it, and we're not aware of any actual denial, but we appreciate clearly okay. 92,000 is way more comments than there we There was common get. opinion that that was a, a technological disruption. Um, we see in South Africa a concerted effort to frame a copyright bill as being about a creator rights agenda written to benefit, quote, suffering creatives, no less. When it's not a secret that lawmakers in South Africa were heavily influenced by U.S. tech interests and their allies to adopt what is essentially a pro-tech bill. For years, we've seen the deployment of concepts like freedom and democracy, free speech, freedom of expression, free internet, used to defend the safe harbors, to legitimize what is too often the freedom to rip off members of the public and make it look like a public need backed by a public outcry. Who loses? The public, including authors, musicians, songwriters, photographers, and filmmakers, and also any member of the public who is trying to gain objective knowledge on the internet. The actual damage to the public interest and to public knowledge caused by this type of misinformation has yet to be calculated, but it's an activity that functions like any other online falsehood. Singapore has proposed a law called the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Bill that would cut off profits of sites that spread misinformation that drowns out authentic speech and ideas and undermines democratic processes and society. With respect to sites that manipulate in order, to, in order to incite feelings of animosity toward the rights of others, perhaps there should be a law in the United States too. The US Copyright Office always welcomes input on its initiatives, but if the public's view of Section 512 or of copyright law in general is distorted by misrepresentation of fact, by corporate-supported advocates marching under the flag of freedom of speech and freedom of expression as justification for private freedom from the constraints of law, it would seem that this issue would benefit from government study, or even better, from a new law. Thank you to the Copyright Office for providing to the public an opportunity to express our views. Thank you. Uh, Keith Cooper-Schmidt, if you can come up. And then I should have noted, we have 15 sign-ups. Uh, I'll check in the back, see if anybody else has signed up since. But Considering the time limits we have, no more than five minutes uh, per person, and we may interrupt with some questions, so just keep that in mind. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm going to touch upon a few issues that I have my little card up at the end, my panel, but I wasn't able to, to talk about, so I figured I'd raise them here, and then a few other issues that came up after the panel. So um, the issue of burden came up during my panel, and... The, and, and also, I think the, the panel that follows, like, who should have the burden? Is the burden placed on the right person? And I think, frankly, that kind of misses the point, or at least misses the point with the problem with the DMCA as it, at ex, as it exists today. Because the primary problem is not that the copyright owners shoulder most of the burden. The problem is that when they do take on that burden, they have very little to show for it. Um, uh, because the notices they, they send basically have very little effect. The, the material goes back up online, and you know, and it's sort of this game of whack-a-mole, which we heard earlier. And so the result, um, the result in the burden being mostly uh, exclusively placed on the creative community is that we are not achieving the balance that Congress had intended here. And so, once again, just on the issue of burden, it's really not, not so much... Um, who the burden is placed on or whether it should be placed on the creators. The fact is it is placed on the creators now. There's no doubt about it. But when that happens, when they take on that burden, it basically is not having the effect that it was intended by the DMCA. There was a discussion on my panel on fraudulent notices. 
just wanted to mention what we are doing to try to rectify not only fraudulent loans, but frankly, just to educate creators. If you go to our website, at the Copyright Alliance website, you'll see uh, we have not only FAQs, but we give presentations across the country on the DMCA and other issues. We've been at VidCon several times to explain kind of how the DMCA works, answer questions, things, things like that. We, for the creators who are members of the Copyright Alliance, we create a DMCA toolkit, which explains the DMCA, and we answer their questions. But perhaps most importantly, we have a video series that's online about the DMCA, both from the sender perspective and also the recipient perspective. So we talk about notices and counter notices to try to educate people. And hopefully, to the extent that there are fraudulent uh, notices being sent, that that, that is um, significantly limited, and we would encourage others to similarly do educational programs to educate the individual creators, because to the extent there are sort of wrongful, or I think you call them wonky notices, um, wonky notices out there, it largely comes from non-educated people. I think there are a few people that certainly do try to abuse the system. Um, and then there was a discussion also about these fraudulent notices in 512F and why there are so few 512F challenges. I've got a wonderful bill for you to support the CASE Act. If you really want to see these case, case challenges go to, go to, come to fruition, because that's one of the claims in the CASE Act that can be brought, and it would be a lot less expensive to do it in that context than try to bring, bring one of these claims in federal court. Um, and then just very quickly on a few other issues, red flag knowledge. I just want to reiterate because we talked about that at the first panel, but then it really didn't get too re revisited or revisited very much. But I think it was very, very interesting that no ISP, no platform around the table, either at the first panel or in subsequent panels, could come up with one example um, that was red flag knowledge, would qualify, or wasn't, you know, that wasn't actual knowledge. Um, and so I think, I think that is extremely significant. We have made the claim, a bunch of us have made the claim that the red flag knowledge standard has been written out of the statute. I think that helps prove our point um, because it really, really has. And and one of the speakers earlier in, in the first panel talked about, well, it was intended to be narrow, and I'm not so sure it was intended to be narrow, but it certainly wasn't intended to be so narrow that it was never used and never applied, and so that certainly isn't the case. A couple more points. Um, Actually, I'm going to ask you just to wrap up quickly. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. I'll just make one more point then, which is on the Fourth Estate case, because that came up and we never really got to re talk about that. I mean, basically, the Fourth Estate case has created a new DMCA requirement that didn't exist. So if under 512F, if a copyright owner files a notice and the alleged infringer files a counter notice, the OSP must repost the infringing material unless the copyright owner files a complaint against the infringer within 14 business days. So, given the pendency times, at least as they exist today, and the high cost of expedited registration, especially in the case of mass infringement, it, it, this decision effectively requires notice senders to register their works with the office first, to the extent they can. Those who have large portfolios, and as well as individual creators and small businesses, simply can't afford to do that. And so this is, this is this for the state case, which shockingly wasn't really discussed during any of the panels, um, well, the is, fourth estate opinion doesn't mention Section 512. Sorry, what's that? The opinion doesn't mention Section 512. It doesn't, but it has a real-life effect on Section 512. In, so. in the circuits that were applying the other rule. So. Right. Well, yeah, but that's now the Supreme Court has handed down that, that Dan did another case. It certainly has a real-life effect. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rasenberger. Hi, thank you. I just want to also follow up on a couple issues that were raised in other panels. Um, first, I want to second and support Mr. Wang's testimony from the third panel, I believe it was. Um, as a writer, I hear authors saying exactly, yes, thank you, the same thing literally every day. They feel completely helpless vis-a-vis -vis piracy. There is nothing they can do. I, we have members who spend uh, one has admitted she spends 50% of her time dealing with piracy. Um, it's shocking. This is taking away from their writing time. Most of the authors just, they give up. They literally, we did a recent survey where we found that the um, mean author income is 20000 a year for full-time authors. That's full-time authors. They do not have the money or the resources to fight. Um, 
we are allowing ISPs to profit from infringing content without compensation to the creators. And, and I do want to note that there was an, a large absence of creators here today. And one, that was because this was billed as a update on the law on the cases. And um, most creators don't know the law very well. They're not lawyers, um, or they, uh, the creator groups don't have lawyers um, on staff um, or that they can afford to send here. We are part of a group um, that I organize of 20 different creator groups. We talk monthly, um, and not a single other one of them um, thought it was appropriate to come today. So I do feel like there's been an absence of that voice. Um, so I think we just we need to step back and decide whether, as a country, we want to protect copyright. And if we do, we need to amend 512. I agree that ISPs have real concerns, but this is really a matter of who bears the responsibility and risk. We've already seen how the major internet platforms have really drained money out of various content industries. And I'm happy to get you some of those stats. John Taplin, in his book, Move Fast and Break Things, um, cites a number of those. Um, the balance that, was the, that Congress thought it struck with 512 is not working. And I don't think we need any other proof than to see the transfer of wealth that has already happened. Um, and if we don't fix this, really shame on us. Shame on us. The EU has the courage to take it on. We can, too. Um, Second thing I want to mention is 512J. Um, it has not been used um, because of how narrow the relief is um, and the uncertainty as to its application, particularly with what the courts have done with other section, sections of 512. Um, the relief provided is very narrow. Um, I won't, given the limited time, you can go through them, the sections yourself. My page is not scrolling down. Um, there's, it's for providing, uh, the first uh, injective relief is uh, providing access to specific infringing material. Uh, the second is for terminating accounts of subscribers uh, and uh, of specific subscri subscribers. And the third is such other injunctive relief as the court may consider necessary to prevent or restrain infringement of copyrighted material if such relief is the least burdensome etc. Um, it costs a lot of money to sue. 512J does not give you the ability to recover costs. Um, for I, you have to bring a case to get rid of one account. So the value proposition just is not there. Same for section two. You can get the same relief from filing a takedown notice. Um, so it, just, it doesn't address the whack-a-mole problem. For three, we can't figure out when we could bring that, honestly. Um, I also want to, last thing I'm going to mention is in the um, last panel, it was mentioned, uh, Google's demotion of sites was mentioned. And I want to say that they have been um, helpful to us in telling us how to use that. That's We've actually gotten authors together to do these massive takedown notices to Google to get sites demoted. And um, that has worked. Um, however, it does not address the problem where uh, the users know the name of the site because they can just type it into the, the um, URL box. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pariser. Thank you. I, I just want to make a couple of uh, brief points. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to reiterate the point that I made at the New York Roundtable two years ago when asked, what can the Copyright Office do to help in this situation? And what I said then was, um, uh, other than write a great report that will utterly support our side, um, on my wish list. Um, I also think the Copyright Office could hold a round table much like this around the idea of standard technical measures. You heard me say, and others uh, say today, filtering technologies are plentiful, they are reasonably priced, they are effective, and they are working. And you heard others say, no, they aren't to each of those things. These are facts uh, that can be determined. And I think 
think would be very helpful in everyone understanding what is out there. We might never get to the point where any of them rise to the level of a, a statutorily mandated stat, uh, standard technical measure uh, within the definition of 512, but at least if we knew uh, kind of factually what was out there and what was true and what wasn't, I, I think that could help move the conversation so that two years hence we won't be sitting here saying there's filtering technologies, no there aren't, et cetera. So I think that would be a tremendous service to all of us. The other point I wanted to make is um, at in the reply comment, uh, uh, notice you asked. Um, it is indeed a uh, tale of two cities. Are there any neutral principles we can look to to determine who is correct, for lack of a better term? Uh, and our answer to that question at the time was uh, look to notices. Um, there's a huge amount of notices, they are not dropping, uh, and therefore it can't possibly be the case that um, this system is working in any real sense because uh, if it were, piracy would be dropping and that would be evidenced by a diminution of notices. Now it appears that notices are dropping. So this is a very important fact, but it's important to understand why notices are dropping. They are not dropping because piracy is dropping. To the contrary. Uh, there's a number of different explanations for this. I'm not here to tell you that uh, anyone is, is controlling, but uh, they include the fact, as you heard today, that copyright owners have notice sending fatigue. In addition, uh, copyright owners, in part because of the demotion system that Google has thankfully put in place, uh, a lot of copyright owners are now fo focusing on what we call top of search. They are sending notices just for the, the sites that appear on that first page because all of the links further down are in fact less important. Uh, so we're not, they're not gonna run up the numbers just for the sake of running up the numbers. They're going to use their uh, notice sending tools uh, in a more surgical fashion. So naturally the number of notices are going to drop. Um, third, the piracy landscape is shifting. It is shifting from peer to peer and in particular torrents to search and other forms of piracy, the result of which is the number of notices drop. Torrents, just to give you an example, torrent, as you probably know, um, can generate uh, tens of thousands of uh, noticeable links uh, for a particular work. And indeed, if you're the copyright owner and you have the resources, you send tens of thousands of notices for all those links. But now, as, as piracy ship shifts to search, that's now going to be 10, 20, 30 links uh, because a site is basically doing all of that aggregating for you that the that the peer-to-peer -peer system used to have to do the work of. I, we can explain this in more, more detail uh, if you have questions about it, uh, but the bottom line is that sites that deliver searchable uh, uh, streamable um, content. I'm saying I'm, I'm misspeaking. I think I'm saying search instead of stream. I'm misspeaking. That's the problem. Sorry. <laughs> so the problem is that piracy is moving from peer-to-peer -peer torrent type uh, piracy to streamable piracy, and a site that delivers streams is going to uh, give you many fewer links that can be noticed. The result of which is, it looks like piracy is getting better, but all that's really happened is we've moved it into another area. Does okay. that make the, the notice system easier for copyright owners to enforce against streams or, or, or not? Not really. I think there's fewer notices, but the result we've complained about, which is that the, the titles repopulate instantaneously, so when we're in whack-a-mole land, hasn't changed. Um, and there are many more streaming services. They are very, uh, uh, they proliferate very easily. Uh, and so we're kind of in the same world we always were. It's just that it looks like from the transparency report that uh, notices are going, that piracy is dipping, but in fact, it's just shifting from one to another. Finally, you can look at money. 
Um, you heard a lot today about the fact that um, everybody's making money and uh, they're uh, tech services are paying uh, content uh, billions of dollars and it's a rising tide and it's lifting all boats and everybody should be happy and content should be happy. Uh, but the fact is that's not really what's going on. Uh, tech companies are making vast amounts of money and becoming the most profitable businesses the world has ever known while content is relative to what it had been shrinking. Uh, you heard Dr. Burris give you the, uh, the statistic that uh, today the industry is worth a billion dollars, whereas on, a, on an adjusted basis, previously music had, would be $21 billion. Um, yes, uh, not every industry is being devastated equally. Uh, the motion picture industry is doing all right, um, but relative to what it would be doing absent piracy, uh, it would be a completely different story. Whereas internet services uh, are, are spending a tiny fraction of their uh, revenue on takedown tools, on piracy, on uh, response to notices, uh, and it obviously has not affected their bottom line to any great extent. So perhaps another neutral factor you can look to to find out who's right. Thank you. You bet. Ms. Sheckler. Thanks. I'm Vicki with the Recording Industry Association of America. Uh, a couple of points. Can you, can you just repeat that before? Vicki Sheckler with the Recording Industry Association of America. Um, so a couple of points. On the third domestic panel, um, there were some statement made about some facts that are completely in opposite of our experience, um, particularly with respect to counter notices and to notices that are sent to search. Um, I refer you to the comments that we submitted to the Copyright Office in the past on our experience uh, with counter notices and fraudulent counter notices, as well as our experience um, with search notices. And um, you know, we have a 94 or 96 percent takedown rate with uh, Google right now with the search notices and the other four ones that were never indexed that we're like, giving them proactively to say, you know, these aren't in your index, but these are still infringing sites. Um, as uh, you may know, we send millions of notices annually to give you a sense of our experience on that. Um, second, Jenny mentioned to you, you know, the evolving nature of piracy. Um, one thing that the, the RIAA that our members experience um, that may be different from some of the others is uh, the problem that we call stream ripping. Um, which you know you may have heard, in, um, wherein these um, practical sites circumvent the anti-circumvention measures for an audiovisual piece of content, rip out the audio of it, and then distribute the audio to whoever you know may choose to get it. These stream ripping websites sometimes do not have any type of static deep link URL that we can send a notice to anybody about. Um, so um, that is an evolving nature of piracy. It is an area where the 512 notice system simply will not work because there's no deep link notice to send on that one. Um, and then lastly, as you know, Jenny noted and as, as Richard told you earlier, um, you know, yes, we are happy to see that recording revenues are starting to rise finally. However, it, let's be absolutely clear, they are nowhere near the peak of where they used to be. We are you know, 14 billion in actual dollars in the United States in 1998, 21 billion if inflation adjusted today's dollars. Um, and now we're at nine. So uh, you know, have we been devastated in real economic terms? Yes, we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Hatfield. Thank you. One of the things that I've not heard discussed is the downward economic pressure that free access places on the entire ecosystem for what I do, which is create music, invest money to document it, and then put it out into the world. No one in any market can compete with free. And when the free that we're being forced to compete with is our own music, music which we invested a great deal of time to create and a great deal of money in which that we invested to document it, in the hopes that we might get a return on that investment so we can come up with the money to do the next project. 
it's devastating. It's incredibly unfair. In 2014, a professor named Eric Priest wrote an article, he published it anyway uh, at that time, he might have written it earlier, uh, that examines what happens when copyright owners are unable to monetize their works at the points where consumers derive value from them. He focused on the experience of the film and music industries in China and found that it d illustrated three ways in which the diminishment of capital revenue streams harms producers. One, monetization opportunities for smaller and independent producers are dra drastically reduced. Two, market signals are sent to producers. Um, market, market signals sent to producers are reduced and distorted, and producers are disproportionately exposed to idiosyncrasies of peculiar markets and exploitation by intermediaries. China's experience with monopsony intermediaries that pay minuscule royalties to copyright owners provides a glimpse into what may possibly be our own dystopian future, a future in which few legitimate digital distribution platforms become dominant while piracy remains unchecked, despite all of the forgive me, crocodile tears for the small startups, the consolidation in the big tech industry makes it really clear that there's something else going on. Even when a winning platform or platforms in this space emerge and become ubiquitous and reach monopsony status, they will have little incentive to maximize royalty payouts and it will be difficult for copyright owners to withhold content and reject their terms. In other words, undervalued inputs in one part of the music ecosystem impact all parts of the ecosystem, creating systematic dysfunction and prejudicing creators. If music is devalued anywhere, it's devalued everywhere. I've been doing this for over 40 years. I don't know any musician that hasn't had their music illegally posted on user uploaded sites and I don't know any musician, no matter how famous they are, that have more live gigs now than they used to have. We used to have, part of why so many musicians agreed, I was there de debating and arguing with people when the DMCA was created. We saw this as an opportunity because we saw the internet as this glorious thing that would allow us to get directly to our customers. We were replacing a group of middlemen that were greedy, record company executives. But at least those greedy record company executives invested in us. They have so little money now that it's commonplace for indie labels. I'll go spend ten to $30,000 to make a record. I, I paid for everything. I'm going to go to the label. They're going to charge me five to $10,000 to release it, and that's not enough. They got a five or a 10 year license where they, any additional revenues, like if somebody uses it in a film, they make that money. That's not enough. They then want to give, want to take a percentage of our tour money. They, before the internet, the record companies used to give us tour support. That's all gone. So just to kind of wrap this up, the DMCA was intended to balance. I, were you saying me? more live touring or less live touring? Less before? live touring. Less and less money from it. I mean, I, I, I can name some famous acts that don't even pay their opening act anymore. They charge them for the exposure. That's how devastating this entire thing has come. The DMCA was intended to balance the interests and, of service providers, content creators, and owners, as well as the consumers of content. It's not that we failed big media companies, it's that we failed to capture the potential of the internet to empower artists and to allow them to determine the contours of their own careers. When we reform rules like Section 512 of the DMCA so that it does not take an army to enforce copyright, we expand the choices of artists. And these artists want to create. They will be empowered to create even more wondrous things for all to behold. And the service providers will benefit from that. For anyone that questions the value of artists' work, just ask yourself a simple question. Who wants a device or a subscription or even free access to a platform devoid of interesting content? The music community values the internet and the tech companies that helped create it. But our content brings value to their enterprise too. We only ask for a fair and equitable percentage of the revenues our work generates. It's time the tech companies realize that without our content, their platforms will be less valuable. We ask that they join us in contributing to the creation of a fair and sustainable digital ecosystem, one where all the participants share equally in the benefits as well as the responsibilities required for the internet to fulfill its promise. And if you doubt what I'm saying, the easiest way to understand things like this sometimes is just, I'm in Washington, forgive me for quoting Deep Throat, but follow the money. Look at 1998 when the, and I'm not even adjusting it. 
The RIA said the music industry was worth $15 billion. Last year, it was worth 9.8. Look at the dominant internet things. You look at, they, they measured their, their worth in, in millions, maybe hundreds of millions. AOL was at the top. Now, the I'm, I'm, gonna have to, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Um, well, last, last point. It's, it'll be over. Now it's a trillion-dollar industry. So just the last time I checked, the remuneration paid out by streaming services is less than six ten-thousandths of a cent per spin. The user-uploaded content services like, like YouTube pay even less. To generate the U.S. monthly wage, minimum wage, of $1,400 on YouTube, one needs 2,133,300 monthly spins. And that, that's if they pay you everything the mechanical licensing, the, the, the pu publishing, the composer, and you happen to own all of that. That's Thank not sustainable. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to jump now to Professor Goldman, who has a training about 30 minutes to catch. I'm so sorry to jump out of line. Thank you for accommodating me. I'll keep it brief. Um, the statement that no one can compete with free aid, we did hear from a representative today, Mr. Poland, who told us how he competes with free aid. So we do know that there are different content creation models, um, different uh, that we need to support. Um, I've been confused by all the discussion that there's been no examples of red flags of infringement um, because uh, the Ninth Circuit, told us, Ninth Circuit told us what constitutes red flags of infringement, told us that third party notices about content could constitute red flags of infringement. So this is from the Ninth Circuit's UMG versus Shelter Capital case. Um, I don't understand why there's been such fud on that topic. Um, I do want to remind everybody uh, there's a lot of references to tech giants and or to the dominant platforms. Um, Google and, and Facebook are integral parts of our ecosystem, but they are not the internet. There's a whole lot of internet that's worth fighting for. Um, and we have seen over and over again regular temptation to think that Facebook and Google's activities need to be corrected and applying that across the entire internet. That I think would be a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, last thing I'm just going to mention is about um, the discussions about when services curate content and what consequence that has had. And I just want to mention some things that we've learned from Section 230, um, which says that websites aren't liable for third-party content with some minor exclusions uh, or some statutory exclusions, including um, IP. Um, and we don't ask those questions because Section 230 categorically protects all editorial decisions on the part of a service. It, it um, uh, uh, protects not only selecting what to publish or not, but also then all of the other steps in a curation process, what to prioritize, how much to show, what metadata would be appropriate around it. Um, and that model has worked really well at, at helping sites understand now what they can and cannot do. Um, in Section 12 land, I would propose a way of thinking about the creation question as um, once it starts out as third-party content, it remains third-party content. The only question then is, is it still being stored at the direction of user? What evidence do we have that the user did not want to store that? Section 230 actually offers some insights on that. There's a case called Batzel, which said that when someone submits content to a site without intending to be published, and then the site publishes it anyway, that's now no longer protected by th Section 230 because of the fact that the site made that publication decision and not the user themselves. So we have some models from Section 230 that will help inform this curation question, but recognize that one of the things that Section 230 is best is moots that curation question, because there's a thousand different editorial decisions uh, that sites can make, and if we try to parse between these decisions don't constitute editorial discretion, these do, it's a losing game. We can never solve that. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to go now to Mr. Wong, who... Yeah, I think many guys have already addressed uh, very important issues, but uh, I'd like to add four points. Uh, first one, uh, one is the, the big companies always say with the new law, it might let them face the legal uncertainty. That's quite a, a common question to ask in Europe. You know, who didn't face certainty in your life and your career? Everyone faced. When you do something wrong, we want to to take advantage of others' work without permission. You, of course, at least face uncertainty. That's the thing we want. The, right now, the only concern, uh, certainty that some big companies want is just making money, no responsibility. That's the certainty they want. 
They don't want to face any a law, potential law, sealed anything uncertainty they don't want to face. But that's not fair. Two, uh, I'd like to address this. this uh, you know, it's not my 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 opinion, but I agree with that. Some uh, Europe Parliament members, they raised this level this issue to human rights level. When I first heard this, whoa, big word, human rights. But I checked online and I che uh, and I checked their their message, and it it is. Many guys always say this, you know, the upload the future, the First Amendment, the freedom of speech. Yes, that's important. That's why I came to this country, right? But according to the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, no, uh, Article 17, uh, second item, no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their, his, his property. And IP properties are their properties. So when you emphasize the freedom of speech, you're also violating the people's human rights and against their will, the authors, the content creators' will. They don't want to be treated this way. It's their property, and you're using it for profit. That's not fair. Three, uh, the lobbying. Uh, right now, this issue is a global issue, but in the United States, I kind of, I'm not, I'm not right. It's kind of like, you know, it's not well presented in, on public, uh, on internet. Quite often, you see the Americans uh, argue for the comments with the religious issue. Oh, this is this lobby, lobby, lobbying fight between the publishing companies and the new tech companies. Oh, they, this time the big companies win. Next time big publishers, uh, the, the movie industry win. Honestly, no, if just lobbying counts, you know, no matter who wins, the people, the individuals lose. When the law is made by and for those who has more lobbying power, the system got a problem. I think law should be guaranteed to protect individuals, to protect public interest. Uh, if the law is influenced by these lobbying powers, it's to me is essentially no difference from how law is made by dictators around the world. Uh, last, uh, democracy, about democracy. I want you guys to remember, you know, creators are only very few on internet. It's they, are, they, are, they are minorities. Majority internet users are just read, listen, watch, the internet, enjoy the content. They don't create the content. That's why in this the Euro, Europe, you hear so many overwhelming voice against the uh, copyright directive. Most are com copyright users, uh, the, the, the internet users. Yes, of course. The one uh, Europe Parliament member told me, uh, told us, not only me. You know, you are minorities here. If we don't voice for you, no one would. They're gonna crush you. You, you, you your voice will be, you know, uh, submerged by the, everyone, ah, it's just a link, ah, it's just a poem, it doesn't matter, it's just a piece of music. They just enjoy this. So it's helpless for uh, creators. Uh, let's see, okay, I think I can have enough time. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Levy. Um, and so Art Levy, Association of Independent Music Publishers. Uh, in some of the panels today, we discussed the fact that the possibility of using a representative list in a notification has been essentially written out of 512 by the courts. And that, combined with how the red flag concept has been narrowed, may ultimately mean that any DMCA notice must identify specific instances of infringement, as opposed to identifying copyrighted material that is representative of the material generally being infringed. Uh, lens may also require some form of fair use analysis for each notice, which in turn may prevent rights holders from being able to use automated systems to identify infringements and make notices. All of this means that publishers and songwriters are effectively pr prevented from protect, protecting their works due to the massive investment in money and time required to specifically identify each instance of infringement. We've heard that many copyright owners have simply stopped sending DMCA notices. And we've also discussed how there are filtering tools that are currently in use like Content ID and Content Match that can be used to efficiently identify and take down multiple works after the import of certain information specific to a copyrighted work as opposed to the location of a specific infringement. 
And these are tools that could be used to slow the tide of infringement. So we have a problem. And we have the tools that can help fix it. What we need now is some help to rebalance the DMCA. And while there are problems with some of the developments in Europe, recent cases, and the passage of uh, Directive 13, or now 17, I guess, provide a positive roadmap of sorts for US reform efforts, which should focus more on shifting the burden of policing the internet from the copyright owner to the copyright user. And uh, finally, I just wanted to thank the Copyright Office for this opportunity. With the speed of developments in the technology sector, it makes a great deal of sense to reevaluate this law periodically. And if, as we hope, the Copyright Office recommends some improvements here, uh, I hope that, uh, that you all will recommend that we continue to reevaluate uh, and make adjustments to the law when necessary. Thanks, guys. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Mazziotti. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the Copyright Office for this opportunity. I'm an um, EU Fulbright Scholar. I'm here at NYU from Trinity College Dublin to conduct a study on the issue of remuneration of creators in the online environment. I'm placing a particularly uh, strong emphasis on uh, social media. So I'm here to, to say a few things, hopefully filling gaps uh, uh, in the uh, discussion that we had today. First of all, um, uh, I'm very grateful to the US government for uh, their support on my Fulbright, but I heard today, earlier today, that the EU should be careful with human rights. I think the EU has little to learn from the US on human rights. Also, for the sake of transatlantic relationship, we should say that you know, ma the vast majority of European countries are exceptionally good in providing you know, free healthcare, free education, and also in guaranteeing rights to asylum seekers and refugee law. Uh, beneficiaries. So, uh, and I, I think that at the very end we should be a little bit more careful in using words. Uh, this is, I think, something that we all agree upon. Uh, the uh, EU Copyright Directive. Uh, this has been a long journey. Uh, I wrote, uh, uh, together with the Center for uh, European Policy Studies in 2013, uh, a report after having led a task force that is, was a little bit like based on meetings like this, even though it was not the European Commission holding them. A report that has been downloaded almost 15,000 times, whose title was Copyright in the EU Digital Single Market, which is more or less the same title of the upcoming directive. Um, that was 2013, it was the uh, uh, aftermath of the ACTA and here SOPA PIPA debates and let's say uh, clashes between sectors, between parts of the public opinion and there was very little uh, willingness to discuss constructively about the uh, developments in copyright law. Um, there was a consultation, more or less the same process that you follow here uh, at the Copyright Office. And if you read that report, not because I want to, uh, uh, to do publicity for my work, but you can see clearly in that report that uh, incorporates also policy recommendations, what has been done, I would say very little in this directive, in part of the alarming, alarmed reactions here in the US. What, what we have in this new directive is relatively little. And what has not been done yet, because we don't have a federal system of copyright in the European Union, we have a bunch of national copyright systems that we are doing our best to harmonize. And also, if you look at the Article 13 slash new Article 17, I understand the concerns of the technology um, companies, of the civic society organizations, but you have to understand that for us, it was also an issue of harmonizing secondary liability law. It's something that we don't have because we don't have a common tort law. I'll, I'll be uh, as quick as possible. Um, on Article, uh, former Article 11 and 13, obviously these are not perfect provisions. As someone has stressed, this is the result of very complex uh, uh, um, policy making and lawmaking process. Someone has correctly uh, uh, um, uh, emphasized the fact that the, the government, so the EU Council, has not approved the directive yet. The approval and so the entry into force is expected in the next few days. Um, Article 13 and Article 11, obviously, these are not provisions that convince the European Parliament to vote in favor of this directive. What I have not heard once, I would say one single time today is the fact that Europe in harmonizing copyright is driven by cultural policies. France, 
no? the biggest enemy, let's say, of the tech companies, no? the most outrageously conservative government in the European Union, said with the friendship, and, and I in, in part share their views. Um, France negotiated the copyright directive at the government level through its Ministry of Culture not the Ministry of Economic Growth, not the Ministry of Industrial Development. So you already understand a significant difference with the US. What really motivated the European Parliament to grant a decent majority in the final vote a few weeks ago was not, as I said, Article 17 or Article 11, was mostly, I would say, two components of the new directive. The first is the new exceptions. Someone correctly emphasized we don't have fair use. We have a significant modernization of a few exceptions in the new directive. Uh, teaching, someone emphasized the fact that we lacked a compulsory teaching um, exception, uh, especially uh, uh, in the digital environment. We will have it, thanks to this directive. We also will uh, have a tax and data mining uh, exception, which is beneficial to uh, tech companies, especially in their public partner, uh, private partnerships. And I would say something that I've not heard today. Read the final part of the directive, because what motivated the European Parliament in its approval of the, of the overall bill is the new rights that are being granted to authors and performers. The idea that European Parliament, especially now, is uh, run by a sort of awkward majority in which socialists and Democrats play a role. And it's expected in the, in the next um, elections that this majority will no longer be there. So they will be- I'm going to have to ask you to- Sure. Up. So pay attention to the next frontier of European regulation. It's platform regulation, it's data regulation, it's transparency and fairness, something that can, could upset the technology companies even more than Article 17 and Article 13. I'm, uh, a final uh, uh, thing, I'm conducting interviews and I'm collecting data here, so if after this intervention some of you could actually give me uh, his or her business cards, I would be very happy to arrange a conversation in order to be as informed as possible because I, I would like to reflect uh, uh, this kind of comparison EU, US in the best way. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wolf, and then after uh, Ms. Wolf will be Ms. Gellis, and then uh, Mr. Band. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll try to keep things uh, short. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with a few of the speakers who were just before me that after 21 years, it's good to reflect on what's working and what's not working. Uh, I think from the perspective of those that represent and try to monetize and license the work of professionals, and in this case, uh, visual artists, whether it's motion clips or, or graphic design or photographs, the notice and takedown really isn't adequate because professionals can't spend their life doing notice and takedown. What they really need is incentives for uh, this community to work with the providers um, to find ways to just stop the infringement and also to encourage some type of licensing system that would really work. Uh, if you have a system where you're only, you're only resource is just to have content taken down. Uh, most of the benefit has been used, particularly if anything is time sensitive in the amount of time that it's already been up before it can be taken down. And you're really, you're not encouraging an economic system where uh, you're gonna be able to sustain yourself through the actual licensing of content. And as you all know, no one looks at any website without some kind of video or images these days. Um, so the balance that was promised in the beginning uh, really needs to be re-examined. Uh, part of it is, I think, the way the courts have interpreted a lot of these cases is it discourages real activity between content creators and ISPs, which can be defined as almost anyone. Um, there is filtering that can work. There is image recognition technology. I think everyone's afraid that they may be doing too much, that they will lose the safe harbor protection if they uh, do too much review or curation. 
uh, perhaps there's a way that that can be clarified that you don't lose it if you, you do take steps uh, in that area. And I think the other problem, which we didn't address today, which is the definition of uh, standard technical measures. Um, the way it's defined just doesn't work because um, technical measures aren't done by a broad consensus of users and technology companies. They really come out of different um, sectors that are familiar with their own type of content. So what may work for the music industry won't work for the motion picture industry or work for the the visual arts community. So you, I think that- Do you think the statute leaves that kind of flexibility to have uh, industry specific STMs? Well, it it's it's very unclear because it says it has to, and I don't have it, well I have it on a, the definition. It's really basic, I believe the entire explanation is it um, must uh, accommodate and not interfere with standard technical measures. But, but the definition of, of standard technical measures requires that those standard technical measures are developed over broad, I think, consensus. Uh, I have to, it's, yeah, I have to find it. Uh, so it says it develop. Means Used by it? copyright owners to identify or protect copyright works and have been dealt pursuant to a broad consensus of copyright owners and servers, providers, and an open, fair, voluntary, multi-industry standards process. And so there, that whole, uh, the idea that it's a multi-industry standard process with everyone involved, I don't think that's the way it, that really has worked. I haven't seen any of that happen yet. And you don't so. think multi-industry could just mean, you know, a, a platform and, you know, visual artists, for example. I mean, there's, in other sectors, there might be it's It's possible, but in 21 years, everywhere. it hasn't happened. So right. there, the incentives to encourage that seem not to be there. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, and I think that um, the the great protections that have encouraged ISPs uh, to take down have also discouraged, um, they just designed their platforms around fitting within the boundaries and edges of 512 when perhaps there could be much better platforms, much better content if there was more curation and more working with content creators to create a system where you wouldn't have just to do notice and takedowns, but you would have opportunities for broad licensing. And I'll turn it over to the next one. Thank you very much for having this today. Thank you. Ms. Gillis. Thank you. Uh, two main points. Uh, one, I want to go back to the study, skyisrising.com. And, uh, the question was raised about where the data came from. This is largely industry data, and the final page of the report lists the sources that built it. Also, it's not just showing that like all media, video, books, music, uh, video games, um, that the overall pie is growing for all of them, but also that, as we've discussed throughout the day, that for independent creators, their, market, their markets are also increasing. And when we do our advocacy, we're not just speaking about um, the hypothetical idealized citizen speaker. We are speaking about independent creators who need access to these platforms in order to be able to commercially exploit their creativity. The second point is I wanted to talk about Mavericks because we didn't really do that in my session. Um, largely echoing what Professor Goldman said. Um, I think the Mavericks decision itself was a wrong turn. As a litigator, I'm going to litigate as if it were a wrong turn, especially given that the follow-up decision moved away from it. And I think the error was the at the direction of the users. Um, and I think that the uh, Professor Goldman's comments are important in that regard, that that's creating the universe. And the fact that the platform may be shrinking the universe of content that's going to appear on the platform should not change that ultimately liability hinges on whether the material was at the direction of users to put it in that potential universe of content to be posted. But the big point I wanted to make on Mavericks is this idea, we have this collision now between Section 230 and 512, and this is not a good collision. Because one of the things we see with Section 230 is 
the enormous censoring effects, and I know that that's my ballywick and I keep harping on that, but it's because it's true. When there's the feel, fear of liability, it pinches platforms and they crack down on speech if they can exist at all. Um, we see with amendments that we've just had to Section 230, widespread damage where whole swaths of content that used to be able to live quite happily on the internet, legal, lawful content, has now been taken down by platforms because they're so afraid of the new liability regime that may target them. Oh, um, you have a can question? I yeah. just ask a qu mm -hmm. question about that? Um, so a lot of people have said that SESTA has created these vast chilling effects on the internet, but didn't Section 230 already exempt out criminal activity in the first place? So I think the question is, why did they bother to do SESTA when you already had some language on 230 would do the job, of which I can say there was no good reason, and what they ended up doing was making a statutory change that certain promoters thought was going to be Certain promoters may have thought it was minor, other promoters may have thought it was actually major and this was entirely what they thought happened, but it was unnecessary. But the consequence of it is it changed just enough to cause so much uncertainty to the immunity, because it's more than a safe harbor, it's an immunity. You don't even have to litigate it and spend the cost to litigate to find out whether you have the safe harbor, which we do in 512 land. Um, it caused so much damage that platforms have reacted to, I mean, the one of the first and most famous was Craigslist del deleted its entire adult personals ads. This is legal, lawful content, but because it had enough qualities where it could possibly be caught up in this awful definition of the way the statutory changes happened with, it was SESTA, it became FOSTA, so just for clarity, we'll call it FOSTA, but those changes ended up removing the safety that the platforms were relying on in order to allow this great cacophony of user dialogue, discourse, speech, etc., cetera, where um, the censoring effects have been real, measured, observable, and they're now being challenged in the courts about whether this was constitutional at all. But the point is, this is something we should be very reluctant to look for, and as a regime, small changes can have huge impacts on the amount of speech that we can still have online. Um, the one other point I wanted to flag with um, Mavericks with this idea that if you moderate, moderation shouldn't challenge it. But one of the other things is just to echo what I was saying before about if you moderate, I think there's this idea that moderating, you're looking, you're seeing, well then you're seeing the infringement, so therefore um, now you're safe harbor is in jeopardy if you don't do something about it. And again, I think the same challenges that happen with a takedown notice or happen with any sort of content of is it copyrightable, who owns the copyright, was there fair use, was there a license. Somebody who's moderating the content and particularly in a position where the live journal moderators were, they're not going to have access to that information to truly know anything that should be driving their, deci their decision or at risking their safe harbor. Um, I think it's really important, as we're discussing with 230 and 512, that for these protections to be useful and valid and ultimately protect the platforms to protect the speech, they have to be robust and reliable, and we should be really reluctant to mess with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Band, and then Mr. Graz, who I already see in the back, you'll be next. Uh, thank you. First, I wanted to agree with uh, our colleague from the European Union. I support Medicare for all. So if you could <laughs> make, make sure that that's included in your report. Um, uh, two two or overarching points aside from that. Um, first, I, I guess the, at a high level, the message uh, from a lot of the 512 supporters is that in your report, we don't we would, we would really urge you not to take 512 in isolation or view it in isolation. You need to first view it in its societal context. Uh, we talked about the importance of internet access, uh, uh, both uh, in terms of, you know, from free speech dimensions, but also in terms of uh, employment and uh, participation in democratic institutions and so forth. Um, so, so that's, that's the first thing. You, you really need to view the, the uh, uh, and as well, the impact of potential impact of filtering and the adverse consequences that could have uh, well beyond the area of, of copyright. So first, the importance of the internet in, in its societal context. Second of all, the legal context that, that uh, uh, 512 was part of a broader legal framework. We only touched on that briefly. Uh, Meredith Rose mentioned that, but that you, you know, we really can't 
rights view 512 in isolation from 1201, which uh, the rights holders have repeatedly said has been so essential for the success of uh, all kinds of uh, 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 content on the internet, which leads to my third point that, that you can't separate, you, you, you shouldn't view uh, section 512 in isolation from the content context, which is that uh, uh, the, 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 there is such now, in part because of 1201, I have to concede that, but for other reasons as well, there is just such an abundance of content available on the internet. Um, uh, if any, you know, I remember at least certainly when, when, when we were talking about the DMCA 20 years ago, there was this notion, well, you know, we have, you know, cable television, we have 500 channels and nothing to watch, right? Uh, whereas now we have a situation where there is an such an abundance of content, it's almost like you have content overload anxiety, right? I mean, you're, you, there's, you can't possibly consume all the great content, whether it's between the, 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 the all the television shows on Netflix and, and Amazon or all the podcasts. I mean, it's just, we're overwhelmed with content. And also when you talk a lot of, with the many rights soldiers, you know, in this context, they complain about uh, piracy. But in other contexts, they basically say, well, we can't, there's just too much competition. There's too many photographers out there. There's too many musicians. The barriers to entry have gotten so low. But I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. I think from certainly the, from the, from the Copyright Office point of view, the more content, and a lot of this is very high quality content, certainly the better. Um, so that's, that's the, the first big area that, that we wanna make sure that, that, that 512 is viewed in context. The second point is uh, one of, the, in, in the last panel, someone mentioned the publisher's right, and I was on a, I, I, uh, I, I heard a, a panel last week in Geneva about uh, where the publishers were talking about the publisher's right and why it was so wonderful. And they said they weren't trying to regulate facts and they weren't trying to uh, regulate free expression. They weren't trying to in, in undermine the quotation right and they weren't trying to uh, uh, limit access to news of the day. However, they did say that they thought that four words from a headline would be an infringement. Now, I'm sorry, four words from a headline sounds to me like facts, sounds to me like chilling free expression, infringing the quotation right and and, and undermining news of the day. And so I think that you know, we really need to be very, very wary about this, this publisher's right and make sure it doesn't come here. It would clearly be unconstitutional. Uh, and so uh, you know, that, it's like a horrible idea. I know it's beyond the scope of uh, this report, I hope. But it, it yeah, was- Yeah, but you have 50 more seconds left if you want to keep talking about yeah. it. <laughs> And, and so then the, the, the last, the very final point then is, is that, um, uh, you know, also when we're looking at the directive and, and uh, you know, it has some bad ideas like, uh, you know, Article 13, Article 11, uh, but it also has some good things. And so I just want to say the one thing that I think is, you know, there's a couple of good things. I, I think the, the preservation right for cultural heritage organizations is great and also the contract override, so that the notion is that there are certain new exceptions created in the directive, and then it says that those cannot be overridden by contract. Again, I know that's beyond the scope of this panel or, or this report, but again, if we're looking at bringing good ideas from the directive, that's a really good idea you should consider. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grotz, uh, following uh, Mr. Grotz will be Ms. Castillo, then Mr. Carver, and finally Mr. Troncoso, unless anybody else had signed up and I haven't seen it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Joe Gratz. Recognizing that it is late in the day, I will limit myself to one minute and three case citations. Um, my first case citation is uh, to the MP3 Tunes case. There's a question that came up a number of times about what what is a real world example of something that would qualify as red flag knowledge? And we get one from that case. Um, in that case, there were a lot of facts. Um, but one, one set of those facts was about Beatles songs. That is, the, the uh, service knew that they were only allowed, under their legal theory, to have Beatles songs up that were, have songs up that were lawfully purchased on an online MP3 store. And they knew that Beatles songs weren't available on any online MP3 stores. And they knew that Beatles songs were available in a very particular place on their service. All of that being true, the court said they had red flag knowledge. And I think that's right. Um, 
that's the first case citation. I want to turn briefly to expeditiousness. Um, I think courts have been correctly recognizing that expeditiousness depends on the circumstances. My second case citation is Long against Facebook, in which I represented the defendant, um, came out about a month ago. Is this the same as Long v. Dorset? It is. Okay. Um, uh, you're aware of the case. I won't belabor it, except to say it rec reflects the flexibility um, with which courts are taking into account the, um, the different uh, 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 facts that I, can add up to expeditions. Go ahead. I do unfortunately want to ask a question, though, which is yeah. how unique do you think the outcome of that case was to the facts of that case, right? In that case, they basically say five days is expeditious, um, but it dealt with the fact that I think Facebook was receiving more than 100 notices from this one user about infringing content. Is that right? So the Facebook was re receiving a lot of different communications from this particular user about a, about a, a variety of different grievances. And when asked which one he wanted Facebook to deal with first, that it took a little while to get around to dealing with this one first. And once it got there, it was taken down. Um, and so uh, the point I want to make there is that, so to answer your question, um, yes, I think that th that it is somewhat specific to the factual situation. That is, th there may be situations in which that amount of time isn't expeditious. Um, and there are likely to be lots of situations where a much longer amount of time might well be expeditious, particularly where one service provider receives a notice and there are downstream 512 online service providers, downstream of them, who are in contact with the actual user. Uh, the case said on that is, think about this in the context of the trademark case, Akinok, where there were multiple layers of service providers involved, some of which were liable and some of which were not, um, and they were passing things between them. Thanks. Ms. Castillo. Uh, I'm Sofia Castillo with the Association of American Publishers, and I would like to go back to a point that was discussed during my panel, so that would be panel number two, and also a little bit during the international panel. And it's the notion, um, it's the question of whether bad faith actors should be eligible for the safe harbors. And um, right now, the definition of serv service provider is so broad that a lot of bad faith actors are taking advantage of the safe harbor, even though they shouldn't. And the court in the Sassel case um, said, the definition of service provider is very broad. Indeed, it is difficult to imagine any online service that the definition would not encompass. And so for that, AAP has proposed in the past, and I would like to reiterate that today, um, that one thing the Copyright Office could recommend in a legislative fix is to include an element of good faith into the definition of service provider for purposes of eligibility for the safe harbor. This would be helpful, and it would also maintain flexibility to include different types of safe harbors, so it wouldn't um, it wouldn't exclude certain types of safe harbors as long uh, of uh, service providers as long as they are um, operating in good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carver. Hi, my name is Brian Carver. I'm copyright counsel for Google. Um, Mr. Hatfield's remarks about bad record deals reminded me of an interview I saw with Snoop Dogg where he described those as 360 deals, and he said what that means is they take 360% of everything. Um, but what I actually wanted to talk about was that I've spent the last three and a half years advising the content ID teams and the uh, copyright operation teams at YouTube, and to address some of the things that happened in the third uh, domestic panel, uh, in particular with regards to abusive notices and counter notices, uh, based on sort of our experiences uh, you know, directly with that. First on abusive notices, I can say across all Google products, we probably receive more abusive notices in a week than most other platforms receive in a year. It is a real thing. Um, if we didn't remove removal requests, if we didn't, sorry, review removal requests and didn't have other technical safeguards in place, then you know Justin Bieber would not be on YouTube. I think that'd be a net loss for society. I'll go on the record. Um, <clears throat> um, there was also some complaint about sort of the generic mention of abusive notices without specific examples. And so I wanted to give you just one from a very recent history. 
you can read a number of news articles about this that happened uh, near the end of January, first few weeks of February, uh, the Verge article from February 11th, which you can find unfortunate, unfortunately with the search term YouTube extortion, um, would let you uh, read all about this. But there were two small gaming creators who got two, each got two fraudulent copyright takedowns against their channels. Um, and then they started receiving extortionate threats that if they didn't pay money, they were gonna get a third uh, takedown sent against their channels uh, in the hopes of terminating their channel. Um, we were glad to learn about this while it was ongoing so that we could prevent that termination, but um, this sort of thing definitely does go on. So, but you did, I mean, you used the, the sort of flexibility Mr. Grotz referred to in expeditious removal to, to address that, are you saying, or? I'm not sure I understand the question. How, how, did you, how did you handle that situation? So, you know, it was a sophisticated attack. We, we were fooled initially, and we did remove some videos and apply some strikes to those accounts. Um, but once we learned about it, then we were able to say, okay, like we see that this is fraud, and we're gonna resolve the situation and not take punitive actions against these channels. Um, so, uh, just in one week, uh, last June, uh, when a particular fraudulent reporter decided to automate their submission process, over 50% of the DMCA notices we received that week were fraudulent, that, uh, that we were able to detect, right? Can you clarify, um, when you say fraudulent, do you mean inaccurate or do you mean abusive? Abusive. Um, in that case, do you abide by them? No. We, we try to detect them and prevent them. Okay, so you would not you would not follow it if you determine it's abusive. Right. Okay. Um, on another point about counter notices, um, you heard earlier that 98% of copyright management on YouTube happens through Content ID. That other 2% is copyright removal requests. And anytime I ask the team to pull the stats on counter notices within that 2%, they always come back with a number between 1% and 2% of removal requests ever see a counter notification. So we are talking about a tiny fraction of the sort of overall universe. Um, when we were building the copyright match tool that you heard about, we interviewed a lot of small creators um, to try and figure out what they needed from this tool, and we learned that small creators really are scared to counter notify, even when they feel they're in the right. Um, it, there is a real fear out there. You heard today from a creator who understands copyright really well, who says he's not afraid to send counter notifications when he thinks it's appropriate. I actually don't think that's a common uh, uh, viewpoint with, with most small creators. They're, they're very concerned about the threat of litigation. Um, another, on the other side of counters, we also uh, do see problems in counter notices that are sent. That's why even though the law doesn't require us, uh, we review them uh, for obvious misunderstandings of the process. So we'll see an outraged uploader uh, write something like, this is my video, I recorded myself singing in my bedroom this cover song, this is outrageous, you know, and when the takedown is from a composition copyright holder, we recognize that Music copyright is complicated, and even those who like to sing cover songs may not understand it <laughs> fully. And so what do you do in that case? We refuse to forward that counter notification, right? And in fact, through reviews like that, YouTube now refuses to forward more counter notifications than it does forward, right? Over 50% of them after review, we just never pass along. That's something we don't talk about a lot, we don't get a lot of credit for it, but we're doing it to try and spare rights holders from these obvious misunderstandings of the process. Right? Um, and this point about understanding of copyright law among average users goes to the repeat infringer points that we talked about. So I think it ought to influence how you implement a repeat infringer policy. Because what we find at YouTube is the vast majority of users never get a copyright strike at all. Right? And then of those who ever do get a copyright strike, the vast majority of them only get one. We make you go to copyright school, we make you take a quiz, <laughs> and then after that, those folks stay out of trouble. Of those who do go on to get three copyright strikes and have their accounts terminated, the vast majority of those reach that point within 90 days of creating their account. And so what we find is sort of two drastically different groups, right? Sort of regular people who are trying to do the right thing, who don't understand copyright very well, but who you can guide into doing the right thing. And then another group of people who are probably dedicated to infringement. And so having or forcing platforms to do sort of just one thing with respect to repeat infringer policies would be a big mistake. It wouldn't address these two very different groups of people. I think the DMCA has already done a great job on that front, right, because it talks about that we have to reasonably implement a repeat infringer 
policy and that we have to do it terminate in appropriate circumstances. These kinds of phrases build in the flexibility that you need to deal with those sorts of situations. Thanks. Great. Uh, Mr. Troncoso, with quick apologies to you, Mr. Willen is going to jump up and has 30 seconds, he said, of responsiveness to what Mr. Carver just said. Thank you very much. It was actually in response to what Ms. Castillo said about, about bad faith actors. So the, the idea that we need to somehow redefine the definition of service provider in order to deal with, with truly bad faith platforms, I think is just not consistent with where the law is. Both the Second Circuit in the Viacom case and the Ninth Circuit uh, in the Shelter Capital and Fund cases have said that services that actively induce infringement and therefore that potentially violate the Grokster rule are almost certainly going to, to be found to have uh, control and financial benefit and so are going to be, <coughs> excuse me, in all likelihood excluded from the safe harbors already. So the courts are doing a great job in interpreting the statute as written, in, in separating the sheep from the goats, and the idea that we should do that through the definition of service provider, I think is neither necessary nor would be uh, a good public policy choice. Thank do you, you think there's a problem with it? Excuse me? What would the problem be? Is there a problem with Mr. Castillo's? I mean, it's unnecessary. I, I take your point right. on that. But. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the idea of having a, a broad and flexible definition of service provider is precisely that Congress in 1998, when the safe harbors were enacted, couldn't envision the range of, of potential services that would uh, potentially arise. And so having a rule that, that allows for new kinds of businesses and new kinds of companies to, to get the benefit of the safe harbors, provided that they're doing the things that the safe harbors, sub, safe harbors substantively re require, makes a tremendous amount of sense. Is that, did that answer your question? I think so, but I, I thought Ms. Fustio was just suggesting adding good faith as a requirement, and I wasn't sure if you were concerned that that might, you know, that seems to be also flexible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the problem with that is I don't, I don't know what it means. Um, so we have, a, we have a standard, right, uh, that comes out of the Supreme Court's decision in Grokster that tells us this is a category of bad faith actor, uh, a service that is essentially instructing users to infringe or actively inducing infringement. Um, that, that's, that's the law. We've lived with it for a decade. And, and having that inform who's in and who's out makes a certain amount of sense. No, I understand. But I think her point is if that's one category of bad faith actor, why not have all the categories. I mean, it, it, she's proposing an expansion, I, I would assume, but. Right. I mean, I, 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 I guess I would say without knowing what we mean when we talk about good faith, we, we open the door to, to something that is going to be impossible to actually implement in any systematic way. And I think that the idea, the question of whether a service is acting in good faith or bad faith is one that, that whether through control or through the general way that courts interpret and apply the DMCA is already infused in everything that courts are doing. And you can see that in the results of the cases. Thank you. Mr. Troncoso. Yes, I realize I stand between uh, everyone in the door. Actually, uh, you're fortunate you don't. Professor Tushin's going to have that honor, I believe. I will still try to keep it pretty short. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, I have a little bit of a concern that the conversation at times has take on, taken on a bit of an adversarial content versus tech sort of tone, um, as if the DMCA is sort of a zero-sum game where there's going to be a winner and a loser if changes are proposed or not made. But I think, really, as you look at the statute, it's really important to, to, to bear in mind that there's a broad diversity of stakeholders, even within single categories, right? So on the content side, we heard today, that the licensing models that certain industries use are going to affect what they think are better solutions in Europe or whether the, the, the new con or, uh, copyright directive is going to be workable. On the, uh, I, on the service provider side, there's just a tremendous range of diversity, even on just the 512C side. I think a lot of the complaints that we've heard have centered around a, 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 few, a few stakeholders. But there's just a, a, a much broader range of 512C providers that rely on those protections that, and <clears throat> whose uh, services could be threatened by sort of sweeping changes along the lines that we had see, we've seen uh, proposed in certain contexts. And then on the user side, we've also seen how, for particular users, uh, the DMCA um, either works or doesn't work for very particular reasons and how proposed changes would work or be disastrous for very different reasons. So uh, Ms. Tushnet, sorry, Professor Tushnet rather, has talked a lot about the fan fiction community and how they have particular interest in the administration of the DMCA and how filters could be more, you know, 
quite problematic for them. And we heard the same uh, from the, uh, Ms. Walvers uh, about sort of uh, open source software developers. So I think as you're developing this report, it's really, I would just ask that you make sure that you bear in mind the diversity of stakeholders that are even within these individual categories and that is not sort of a binary sort of uh, content versus tech issue. Uh, and uh, with that, I will uh, yield the mic. Thank you. And Professor Tishnet? So thank you. I uh, just want to pick up on what Eric Goldman said. Um, so what counts as content stored at the direction of the user? When I'm on the bus home and I pull the cord, the bus driver stops at my direction, even though she's the one hitting the brake and opening the door. She may even decide not to stop immediately, depending on what the circumstances are. It's still at the user's direction when she does. That's all. Thank you. Um, I think that was a great moment to end on. All right. <laughs> uh, Short and sweet. I, I believe that's it. Um, thank you for everyone who was here and participated. Um, nothing else to add. <laughs>